Why? Because my stimulus is coming from people. It's not coming from God. So there's a story about a good short cabin that shakes me. There's this girl, and she was she wanted to marry a uh, she didn't want to marry her parents wanted her to marry a Muslim boy because they were poor they didn't have any money and so they said marry this guy and she's like I don't want to marry this guy and they said no you're marrying him he's got money he's going to take care of you we can't take care of you go so she goes to Bunab Shoy and she says I don't want to marry this guy I don't want to become Muslim. And then he kind of takes her and he puts her in the car and they're going to drive off. And what Abunab Shoy Kamil does after that, does anyone know how the story ends? Harvey does because he heard my talk before. Does anyone know what he does, what Abunab Shoy Kamil does? He jumps on the car as it's driving away. In his Faragaya, cars in Egypt are dusty. He's a priest and the guy drives away and kind of tries to shake Abuna off. What is that? What is that kind of action? That's fire. That's the fire of God, right? He sees every soul like that. A girl, he doesn't want to lose her soul, so he jumps on the car. This reminds me of the story of David, right? You know, you know David was a shepherd, and he was tending the sheep, and one of the lions came and plucked the sheep and started running away. Now, if you're a shepherd, what do you do? Smart thing. You gather the rest of the sheep, you put them in a tight circle, and you stand there and you wait for, you know, and make sure that you don't lose any more sheep, right? Because his dad's already going to get mad at him for losing a sheep, okay? So you, you gather the sheep and you protect. Is that what we'd all do? What did David do? Who remembers? He chased after the lion. Now, if any of you have been to a zoo, that's not a natural response, right? Lions are big, they kill people. He chased after the lion, but did he have a gun? Did he have a whip? No, he had a stick. And he beat the lion until it gave up the lamb out of its mouth. And then he took the lamb home. And, and, and God said about David, I found in, my, in the heart of David my heart. That's God's heart. That's the heart of a servant. I don't lose one, not one. And if a lion takes it, I chase the lion down and I beat the lion. That's the servant. That's the, that's the fire that's in, in the servant's heart. And so the Holy Spirit is fire, and there's nothing in the middle. A candle is either lit or it's not lit. There is no middle candle. There is no, I kind of go to church, I kind of am a deacon, I come to Sunday school. Like, that's not an option. Candle's either on or it's off. You're either fire or you're nothing. And those are the options. And so what we do in our life is we dampen the Holy Spirit, right? St. Paul says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. So he uses the word quench, which means water, right? He's saying the, the, the only thing you can do is the Holy Spirit's inside you. And the only thing you can do is put it out. That's the only, that's, the, that's your big, you know, issue. Just don't do that. Just don't mess it up, right? Holy Spirit is in us. It's fire and it wants to come out. Jesus said, where's the kingdom of heaven? Inside you. The kingdom of heaven is already inside you. Right? And so what we do is we get in the way. So that is the quote. Christianity is either fire or it is nothing. Right? And this is what the servant has to be. The servant can't be bored and oh, not another class and I got to do the... Huh. That's not a servant. That's not service. That's not fire. St. Isaac the Syrian says, with the love of God... A person will draw close to a perfect love of fellow human beings. No one, listen to this closely, look at the causality, look at the direction. No one has ever been able to draw close to this luminous love of humanity without having first been held worthy of the wonderful and inebriating love of God. So which comes first, loving people or loving God? Huh? Loving God. Now, what's the, the, the real important part of this story is what? You can't, no one has ever been able to draw close to the love of humanity without first loving God. So what does that mean for a servant? You can't love people until you've loved God. No one has ever been able to. So the love of people is not the driving 
mechanism. The love of, of God is, and then that overflows into a love of people. Okay, if it's like, you know, I really like to serve people and I like the kids this age and these guys are so cute and I can dress them up and I can serve the poor because it makes me feel good about me. There's a lot of me in there. Okay, and what the, f the focus here is the love of God drives the love of people and that's the right order. Abuna Tedros Melati says, um, okay, I'll, I'll go to this last quote Abuna Loa says about him. Is a sermon on love enough? Or is it life? He was the biggest sermon on love and humility. His sermon were like crumbs that fell from his personal life. Abu Nabshoi Kamel was very focused on his own spiritual life. Sometimes the only time we read the Bible is to prepare. The only time we read a book is to prepare for a lesson, for a talk. Right? And what he's basically saying here is the spiritual life is like, um, you can imagine like uh, an iceberg, right? You all know this expression, just the tip of the iceberg. Right? So when an iceberg is submerged underwater, most of it is underneath the water, like 95% of it. And then you can just see a little bit, okay? And all the rest of it is hidden. This is the way the Christians, the servant has to be. Most of your spiritual life is hidden. So you have to focus as a servant on the hidden life, not the seen life. You don't actually want people to see. You want them to see as little as possible. And we have to keep building and focusing on the hidden part. And then what comes out on Sunday or what comes out in the service is it, the crumbs that fall off the table. It's the tip of the iceberg. It's just a little bit. Most of my life with God is hidden. And I want to keep it that way. I don't want everyone seeing my life with God. I'm not interested in everyone seeing my life with God. That's not why I do it. So. What eventually came out of Abu Nabshoi's life was after liturgy, every time he took liturgy, he would go and spend three hours just reading the Bible. Just him. Not to prepare a sermon, not to give a talk, not to give Sunday school, for him. And that becomes the source, right? Christ, this fire lights up inside him. Right? And that's what lights him up. And then from there, he gives. And if he doesn't have fire inside him, he has nothing to give. And Abu Nabshoi knew that. So his inner life and his own salvation were constantly on his mind. I remember my, uh, my father in confession one time told me, he says, don't forget who you serve when I, when I got ordained. He said, don't forget who you're serving. You ain't serving the bishop. You ain't serving the metropolitan. You're not serving the priest. You serve God. So your inner life is your priority. Your salvation is your priority. Service, that's, that's overflow. That happens or doesn't happen. But your own life is the priority. And so as servants, we sometimes lose our own life and we just kind of give and give and give and give. And we think we're doing the right thing, but we're not because we're dead inside. We have nothing left to give. There's no fire. There's no heat. And so everything we're putting out is canned. And everybody can tell. No one's interested in what you're saying because you're not interested in what you're saying. You just want to read the book and be done with the lesson and hope the kids don't mess around. Um, his involvement in church politics. Once there was a big issue that came up and Pope Shenouda actually came out for it to Alexandria to talk to Abu Nabshoi Kamen and said, I want you to help me with this problem. Abu Nabshoi, who's in Alexandria, who's the hegemon of sporting in Alexandria, says, I'm not gonna get involved. He said his own salvation was more important than getting involved. And so his position on church politics was avoid it at all costs. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Don't fret about it. And sometimes we love to just do that. And sometimes we think that that's being religious. You know, we gather together, you know, let's talk about something religious. I know. Let's talk about what's wrong with the churches. Because isn't that religious? Isn't that a religious subject? Isn't that kind of churchy? That's a good thing to talk about, right? And so all we do is we talk about, you know, this guy and that bishop and that pope and that metropolitan and this whatever, and we just love to talk. It does no one any good. Don't do it. If you want to gather and you want to talk about the Bible, you want to talk about Jesus, that's okay. 
right? But talking about church, that doesn't help much, unless that's your job. I'll go to the second bullet. He had this saying that he could not stand the honor of the clergy. Karamt al kahanot. He would never accept that. He says the clergy, they're servants. And Christ was a servant. And you guys as servants are servants. And there's a word. The reason we pick that word is that word has a meaning. We didn't call you, we don't, I, you know, in our church, we don't say Sunday school teachers. Because you're not a teacher. You're a Sunday school servant. And we use that word purposefully. And the servant does what? He serves. He washes the feet. Christ comes. And what does he do? He does something ridiculous. He washes the feet of the creation. Imagine that. Imagine you, I always use this example, you, you know, you're a kid and you build a Lego. Okay, and you make a Lego car. Then you take the Lego car and you put it up and then you bow before it and you wash it. It's like you made the car. You created it. And now you're going to wash its feet. It's the creation. Imagine for a moment if, if, uh, if Abuna comes to wash my feet or the Pope comes and washes my feet. I'd go, no, 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 Sayyidina, don't. Right? I would never let Sayyidina wash my feet. And then Satan insists. I'd probably be in, in, in tears saying, no, Satan, don't. And Satan is what? He's just a man. He's a man like me. And yet I would say, don't, Satan. What about what Christ, the creator, washes the feet? What is that? That's the heart of a servant. That's the heart of a servant. And that's how we have to serve each other. We wash the feet of each other. I will do anything for anyone. There's no karamti. There's no my honor. There's no this is not my job. This is, you know, what do these people think I'm doing? Who do they think I am? Do you think I work for you? Do you think I get paid by the church to do this? I don't have enough time for this. That's not a servant. That's a, maybe an employee who doesn't think they get paid enough. Servant says whatever you need, whatever you want, any time, just let me know. Someone says, I need to talk to you. I'll drop everything. When do you want to meet? And then the, the, this last bullet. When some lax people try to turn, turn the church into a hall for social activities, he stood firm in public after advising them many times in secret. He didn't like the church to be a social place. Church was a place of prayer. It's not about social activities and about sports and about games and about stuff. If that stuff kind of, okay, leads me to God, all right. But if that's just the stuff, no one's interested. Yes? Uh, what would your advice be on a servant that broke to whatever you can to preserve the school area? Uh, yes, man, to whom? Okay, so the, the, reason, the reason I want to serve someone is because I'm serving God, and I'm serving for their salvation, because this is God's heart. So if I do something to a somebody that is bad for their salvation, you know, if they say, I want to go out to the club and whatever, and then I can't be a yes man to a sin, right? But you're saying, what if someone's taking advantage of me? Let them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, every once in a while you hear, well, you know, I don't want to give money to those people because those people use it for stuff I don't agree with. Where is that in the gospel? Who said that? And Babram, the Bishop of Fayyum, wouldn't do that. In fact, people would lie to him, and he knew it, and he gave anyway. That's not my job. St. Isaac the Syrian says, even if a rich man asks you for money, you give it. Okay, why? Because the fact that he's asking for money means he's poor. Something's wrong. Something's wrong in his life. He's broken. So it's not my place because if I start, if I start putting myself into the place of like, well, that's a really good cause. I'll give to that cause. That's not a good cause. I'm not going to give to that cause. What are you going to use the money for? Mm, okay, I'll give you the money. What are you going to use it? Eh, 
I don't think I'm gonna give you the money. Who's, who's now the judge? Who's God? <laughs> who's, who's made themselves into God? Me. God didn't ask me to, to evaluate, just give. Why? Because it's not mine. Your time, your strength, your energy, your money, it's not yours. It was given to you to give to them. Um, Abuna's attitude towards new churches. Youth. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, question yeah. from, from the people on the uh, people. watching online or someone online. Mm. Uh, where do you draw the line between servant's responsibility and the person being served's responsibility for themselves and their salvation? Um, you can't control other people. So as a servant, I would give. Uh, it's not my place. If I have a child, if I have a baby, you know, I'm going to give the baby everything I think it needs. Okay. And every once in a while, I'll try to teach it to do its own thing and I'll push it to maybe do its own thing. But at, but I have to keep giving it everything it needs every time it asks. And sometimes the baby will regress or the child will regress, right? Sometimes I, I've taught my son how to button his shirt and he knows how to do it. And then once in a while, I'll be, we'll be leaving, he's in a rush and he's four and he can't button it. And I'm like, you know how to button your shirt? No, I can't, I can't, no problem. I'll button it, right? And so sometimes we have to step up and, and give, give more love. If you have to err on a side and you don't know, pick the side of love. That one's easy, right? And don't get into this, well, he's taking advantage of me. You should be able to do this by now. I mean, people grow with love, right? People grow with love. When you look at the, the, the sinners that he, Christ, interacted with, he never said, well, you know, you should really stop adultery by now. Or you really should, you know, blah, blah, blah by now. He just loved. He says, I don't judge you. Go and sin no more. Right? And so that's the side he's going to take. As opposed to, you know, you haven't worked out your salvation, so that's not my job as a servant. My job is to give and to love. To the point of death. I mean, what did Christ do? He gave, he gave, he gave, and then he died with his arms open in love and then said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, even as they're killing me. That's the model. Give, 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 give until you're dead. That's the model. And you do it in love the whole time. Hopefully the person online is satisfied with that answer. If not, you can text Shoy. So, um, So one time a youth told a story about Abunab Shoy Kamil. He got a call at midnight and there's a new church starting. And so Abunab Shoy Kamil told him, go and get one of the kits from the, the our mezbah, from the one of the, the, the altar um, bundles and give it to this new church as a gift. And so the youth went and he got one of the youth, the bundles from the altar. And he said, okay, I'm going to take this one and run it over to this new church. And Abuna looked at it, he goes, which one is this one? And he said, well, this is the Wednesday bundle. You know, we have different ones. And he goes, no, 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 no. Give him the one for the Eid. Give him the one for Easter. Give him the Easter chat set. And back then, those things are very expensive. And each church had one that they had saved up for for years. You know, the one with all the gold and all the... And he said, give him that best one. And when these churches would start, he would say, I want to send my best servants to the new church. And he wanted to see lots of little churches sprouting up. In fact, he would look at the, the, the bell tower of, and, the, um, and the big churches, even at Sporting, and he'd say, I wish we were more smaller churches. He loved this idea of spreading, right? And from Sporting came out many, many churches in Alexandria because of this model. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. If you become a servant, it isn't about learning things. So one of the problems we have in the service now is we're using Sunday school as our main weapon of service. Okay. All of you have been to Sunday school. 
What do you think of Sunday school? Yeah, exactly. Sunday school sucks, right? So we, we, we have to start thinking about, as servants, we have to start thinking. I mean, look, half of you are on your phone right now, right? So you have to start thinking about service in a different way. When Pope Shenouda started Sunday school in the 50s, there was a massive problem in the, in the Coptic church. There was ignorance. The priest didn't know anything. The, 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 the Sunday school teacher, there are no Sunday school teachers. No one knew anything about the church. So him and his group, they, get, they got all these books. They, they bought, they imported them, right, from other countries. And they put them in a room. And they said, okay, we're all going to come to this group, this room. We're going to read the seven books that we have. And then we're going to go out to everywhere and we're going to tell them what's in the books because there's no books. There's ignorance. There's no Bibles. Okay. Now compare that to today. And then he created Sunday school as a weapon against that situation. Priests don't know anything. People don't know anything. There are no books. There are no resources. There's ignorance. And now we're using that same approach Sunday school for today's environment. Is that the environment today? Is there anything anyone can't find out? If I want to read about St. Athanasius and the councils and the dogma and the how many, well, just a Google search gives me 72 options. There's online seminaries, there's acts, there's books. You go to the bookstore, there's hundreds of books about every topic, every saint. So what's the environment now? Do we have an education problem in the, in, in, in the world? A knowledge problem? We don't have a knowledge problem. What kind of problem do we have? We have isolation. We have loneliness, we have anxiety, we have depression, we have FOMO, we have kids who are excluded, we have kids who don't belong, we have kids who aren't loved, kids don't feel like they have friends. That's the problems. So the Sunday school servants, we have to shift to that. We can't be fighting the war from 1950 in Egypt saying we need to teach them about the name, the St. Anthony, you know, or I need to tell them the story of Noah's Ark. They know the story of Noah's Ark. Their parents have been telling it to them every night when they go to bed. So that's not the problem. The problem is different. So our approach as servants has to be different. And so uh, in this, this quote, there's enormous difference between religious knowledge as it is marketed in modern days and service. We are not in the business of religious knowledge. Okay, as servants, that's not, that's not what we do. The end result of this process is often a self-admiring contentment. Listen to these words. They should hurt, a self-admiring contentment, and a feeling of superiority over others in spiritual matters. So I read a few books, and then I'm, I'm content, and I admire myself. And then worse, I feel superior over others. I feel superior over the kids in my class, because they don't know, and I know. I, I'm going to teach them. Okay? That's dangerous because now I'm not with them. I don't feel their pain. I don't cry when they cry and laugh when they laugh. I'm above them. I know things. I know the story of St. Athanasius in the Council of Nicaea. Right? And that's dangerous. Christian service, in contrast, focuses on the catechization and reproof of whom? So this comes back to Bishoy's online point. Christian service focuses on the catechization, means the teaching and reproof, that means to webbech, to, to condemn, of whom? Oneself. Wait a minute, I'm a servant. I'm supposed to teach and reproof and reprove people, the kids, right? Am I supposed to teach them and tell them they're wrong? No, 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 no. That's not service. Service is teaching and reproving me. Mastery of my bodily desires and the adoption of a warm and constant state of repentance. For whom the kids? Not for the kids. For whom? For me. In order to receive God's grace. That's what service is. I repent. I teach myself. I learn. And then eh, the crumbs fall. The tip of the iceberg happens. People see little bits and pieces. The end result of this process is usual self, usually self-abandonment, the surrender of oneself to God, the forging of an open and honest relationship with others, and a constant and reverent engagement in worship. That's the servant. The result, 
is self-abandonment, like I don't really care about me anymore, surrender of myself to God, and a forging of an open, honest relationship with others. So the process isn't I got to read a book so I can give a talk. The process is I'm going to work on myself as a servant, as a Christian, and then whatever happens, happens. Whatever God wants comes, comes. But my job isn't to, to tell other people they're bad or to tell them that they aren't up to speed. Because now I'm a judge, and you ain't a judge. That's not our job. We're servants, not judges. So quickly, first, let's understand the difference between a religious teacher and a spiritual servant. Those are two different things. The first, the religious teacher, relays information. And the second builds a soul. And those are very different things. The first, it gets knowledge from books and places it before the students on paper. The second one feeds, the second feeds the ones he serves from his own fullness. How do I feed a, a kid? From my fullness. He shares the inner riches of his faith, his love, his self-sacrifice, his humility. He provides genuine experiences and a living example to those he serves. For it is himself that he gives and it is his own life that he offers. Ah, this is beautiful. I wouldn't have met the miskin with this. So what's he giving? He didn't read a book and tell you a story. He works on himself and then he gives himself. Who else did that? Christ. Christ gives himself. So the servant gives of himself of himself. And it's his own life that he offers. And that's, the, that's what the servant is. Does anyone have any questions? I should just stop. I just can yawn or jump up and stretch and take a breather. Nothing? Okay, Michael's back. We can start now. <laughs> I'll just wait till you come and sit down because it's, you know, I don't want to. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll skip. Yes. Can you explain a So the question is, how can I change my mind to go from being a religious teacher to a character builder? Okay. The first one is I want to change my mind from being a religious teacher to being a repentant Christian. That's it. That's the, that's the, the quantum leap. Okay. Once I move from I'm a servant to I'm a repentant Christian, I mean a really repentant Christian, then everything flows. So I was going to skip this, but I'll continue. It says, the first transmits words and concepts that he heard externally, a religious teacher. The second brings forth words and concepts from within. So the fountain has to be within. And that's why when you're serving and you're living a Christian life, you don't give a talk the way someone else gives a talk. That's okay. You don't use the same examples they give. Right? You don't tell the same stories. Right? I tell my own stories. You're going to tell different stories. Everyone's going to tell from their own fountain, right? Not from someone else's fountain. And I like this. He says, uh, brings forth words and concepts from within an outpouring that rises from his depths like lava erupting from the depths of the earth. Ah, it's beautiful, right? It's like lava that comes up and you're like, you know, and everyone see a volcano and you're like, where's this red stuff coming from? They say, it's coming from the core of the earth. Right? And it just lock comes up and it just huh, keeps coming and it comes up hot and it keeps coming up hot. And that's the Christian life. That's the service. The core is hot. And the, and the, and the, 
that, that what keeps flowing out of the servant is death. Convince his lab- listeners and the second labors to give birth to children in Christ. See the difference? So the focus of the servant can't be on the kids. The focus on the servant is on my own spiritual life. And from there, I keep that core hot and everything comes out. Question. Yes. Is, yes, there, a, is there a benefit to, the, to being the first? Being the first? The spiritual teacher. Say again. Oh, to being a religious teacher? <laughs> to your own ego. It's very good for your ego. It takes you right to hell. Hmm? It's a good way to go to hell. If you don't want, if you want to go to hell and don't want to wait in line, <laughs> you want to be like, like, oh, you're a religious teacher. You come up here to the front, to the front of the line. <laughs> I heard that from Eddie Murphy. It's not funny. Okay, the lesson of love. And then he, he quotes his verse, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. That's what a servant has to be. The lesson of love can never be taught simply by prearranged words. Rather, it is taught by truly giving yourself and communicating the love and longing for Christ to those you serve. The lesson of humility cannot be taught. This, is one, this one's really important, guys. The lesson of humility. How many people have stood there and give a lesson on humility? How many people have ever given a lesson on humility? I gave the best one. <laughs> Best lesson ever. Nailed it. Um, I heard this funny thing. Uh, did you read my book, Humility and How I Achieved It? Okay. Um, the lesson of humility cannot be taught by intellectual persuasion, but only by a prolonged and bitter struggle against one's ego. Whew. How do you teach humility? Fight your own ego. Right? When, the, when the senior servant next to you says, you know, you go, I've got a great idea for something we could do in class. They're like, no, that's a stupid idea. All right. Now we fight. Not with each other. Who am I going to fight with? Now the struggle goes inside because he just shot me down and he's a jerk and he has no right and I'm young and I know what the kid's like and this guy doesn't understand anything and he has an accent. Now where's the fight? inside. Now the fight is against my own ego, my own will, my own desires. What, what, why did Satan fall? What was Satan's sin? Pride. So every sin is the same sin. Ego, pride, fulfilling the self. Every sin is the same sin. So that's how we teach humility. We fight against our own egos, our own pride. And then we, then the kids you don't have to say a word. Don't say a word. Just be. They're going to figure it out. Are you guys done? Should we stop? I'll, I'll, I'll go fast. I have like 700 slides. These are pictures. That's Abuna Tedros Malati. He's cute. That's Abuna Loa. He just passed away. He's also very cute. That's Abun Allah getting ordained. There he is, his ordination day. This is Abun Antonius Hanin, who is my father in confession. He passed away in 19, 2006. Okay, summary of Abun Abshoi, and I'll get close to ending now. Really? Now? You guys can show up? It is not enough. <laughs> All right, let's start over. Mike and Mira here. Um, it is not enough to say prayers. One must become, be prayer. It is not enough to have moments of praise. All of life, every act, every gesture, even the smile on the human face must become a hymn of adoration, offering a prayer. One should not offer what one has, but one, what one is. See the difference? So the servant isn't about, this is, what, this is the knowledge I've attained and this is what I've acquired. This is who I am. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are well. You say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. 
Now, you know, this language for Christ is very, very strong. You know, he usually doesn't talk this strong. But it's like he washed their feet. Okay? You know, and, 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 and notice, you know, what he did. When did he wash their feet? Yeah. The night before he gets killed. You know, the night before your last day on earth is always a special day, right? Usually when people are on a deathbed and they know it's their last day and the doctor says it's just a matter of hours, the family gathers and the person says something. And whatever it is, it's everything, right? It's the culmination of their life. So when, and I don't know if you've ever been to someone's deathbed, but it's a moment and you don't forget those moments. And what that person says after being alive for 80 years and dealing with all the hardship and all the mistakes they've made, they give you advice and it's everything from the heart. So Christ gathered them the night before he's, his last day on earth, on his deathbed, and he said some things. And then he washed their feet. And as if that wasn't enough, because Peter was like, what are you doing? You're not washing my feet. Right? So there was already an effect, right? Peter, you know, Peter's being Peter, right? He's always loud and kind of whatever. Okay. And he has this reaction. And Christ says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. He says, okay, then wash my head as well. But then Christ, it, you know, kind of hits him on the head. Like, if you didn't get it, I'm going to make sure you get it. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, and also, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So if you didn't figure it out, I'm going to make it obvious. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. He's never said anything like that. He doesn't say, I'm an example, do this, because I did this. He's not that clear. This night, very clear. This is the deathbed. This is what you do, right? So back to the, the internet question from Bishoy. What do I do? I wash feet. For whom? The lowest people. How often? As much as they need. Whatever they want. That's my job as a servant. All right, let's talk about stem cells, and then we can go. Do you know what stem cells are? I don't. I'm an accountant, but I Googled it. Stem cells, Wikipedia is a fabulous thing. Now I know why you, all you students cheat using Wikipedia. Stem cells are unspecialized and can rise to specialized cells. Okay? So this process is called differentiation. Sounds like high school bio, right? So what happens is you have these stem cells, and, and when, the, when a baby is uh, uh, fertilized, right, uh, an embryo is fertilized, it starts off with these stem cells, okay? And then the stem cells, all of a sudden, they get like a command, right? Scientists are just beginning to understand the signals inside and outside cells that trigger each stem of the differentiation process, right? So you're the cell, and you're just a cell. Then you get a command, and then it says, you are going to be bone. Then you go, okay, I'm bone. And then this one says, you're going to be brain. Right. Okay, I guess I'm going to be brain. And we were right next to each other. I was right next to the bone cell, right? And all of a sudden, I get called to be brain. He gets called to be bone. This guy gets called to be liver. This one's skin. This one's hair. Thousands of different kinds of cells in the body, correct? Okay. And so many questions still remain. Like, no one actually understands how this works. Okay, so what are we talking about? <laughs> a servant is a called position. It's not something they choose themselves. In Isaiah, it says, you are my servant, I have chosen you. So the point is, you're not supposed to be a Bunim Shoy Kamen. You're not supposed to be another servant. You are supposed to be you. And you get called to your service. And you have to simply fulfill that service as best as you can. So we're not all called to be prayer people. We're not all called to be Sunday school teachers, we're not all called to be serving the poor, we're not all called to be priests or deacons or bishops or whatever. There are many, 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 many roles of service in the body of Christ. Just like there are as many, 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 many types of cells. And so there isn't one cell that's better than another cell, right? I mean, what if the heart cell says, I'm, I'm heart, I'm the most important cell. If I stop, the body stops. Then the brain looks at you and goes, really? What if I stop? And then the bones say, really? What if I disintegrate and you just collapse into a jelly, jelly you know, a, a jellyfish, right? So there is no cell that's more important than another cell. 
Every, I'm, get, I'm getting there, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. So there is no cell that's different. Everyone has its own purpose. And if you are a bone cell, you can't look at the heart cell and say, you know, you're not doing a good job being a heart cell. Let me judge you. And it's, it's funny, but isn't that what we do? We look at someone else's role and we go, eh, they don't do it like they should. And so what, is the, what does the bone cell do? It says, well, okay, I think I'm going to become heart so that I can do a better job. What do you do as a bone cell? Just be bone. Be the best bone you can be. That's it. And if you're the liver cell, just be the best liver you can be. You can't be hemoglobin and you can't be hormones and you can't be anything else. Right? You certainly can't be hair because my hair cells just gave up the ghost. Right? And so no one stepped in to, to save my hair cells, right? Should have some other cells should have said, oh, let's see, arhamu. Right? So um, you can't be a Bunab Shoy Kamil. You have to be you. So each of you is called to a different service. Hear the calling, find the calling, realize it's a calling. And then from there, you be the best you can be in that calling. And then that's it. Nathan, what did you do? What did you do? Really? You're going to cover it? Is, is, is it bothering you? That one little bald spot you got there? That's not painful. All right. Uh, and then finally, some, some words of encouragement. The saints from Abu Nusher came. The saints are not humans without sin. They are humans who have struggled against sin. So you're not called to be perfect. And we'll talk about this at the very last talk of the day. It's not about being sinless. It's not about being good, whatever that means. It's not about being holy, whatever that means. It's about struggle. That's what Christians do. We struggle and we fall and we get up. And this is what, this is what we're called to do as Christians, not to be some level of goodness. And then we need to raise everyone else to that level of goodness so that they're good like us. Because the day we walk into church and we say, I'm pretty good. I deserve to be here. And that person over there doesn't deserve to be here. Then may God have mercy on your soul because you are Nowhere near, you're, you're the guy who's the first person in line at, at hell. The day you say that, when you walk in and you judge another person in the church and say, they're not as good as I am. God have mercy. Any other questions, comments? You know, we have like eight talks scheduled today, so I think I might as well just kind of keep them short and sweet. Eight or 80, I forget which one. Nothing? Oh, Mira. Of course they do. Uh, I, again, I wanted to extend on the fact that the body, like we, we make the body very hot for those kids. Like, if I, I, I feel sorry for them. I didn't grow up with the body was that hot. You should, you yeah. Achievable, and you have to like struggle to get there. Now we make it very high, and if you're not up to standards, please do not bother and come because you're not accepted as you are. Uh, what's what's the word for them? Because they might be... Uh... Yeah. So w one thing we have to remember is that Christ said something that should scare us all. He said, those who are well do not need a physician. And then he said, I'm the true physician. So let's put those two together. I'm the true physician. And if you're well, you don't need me. Is there anyone that doesn't need Christ? So now we have a problem. Because if you're well, or let me rephrase, if you think you're well, then you have a bigger problem. The feeling of being a sinner is the right feeling. As soon as you lose that feeling, something's wrong. As soon as you lose the feeling of I am broken and I can't get up and I keep falling and nothing I do is right, Something's wrong. Now we have a big problem. As soon as you walk in and you're like, so unfortunately what happens is when I stop repenting, I forget. You know, it's kind of like, you know, my kids are older now, right? So my kids don't yell in church as much as they used to. I mean, Gregory still does occasionally, but that's not important. And, um, so sometimes when someone brings a little baby into the church, 
I, you know, they make a sound and I turn around and I look at them. Can't you control your kids? You know, what's wrong with you? You know, the mom, she's scattering and the baby's crying and this one's doing this and this kid over here walking around the toddler. And what do I do as the 50 year old that I just turned? I look at them and I look at them and I, you know, my kids never did that. Okay. And that's actually true. My kids never did that. I was the one parent. Maybe I should tell you this story. I don't know if I should, but one time when we were at, uh, when we were in, at Stanford, we were in a little church and we were in the back. So, you know, you have the, the church here and then they have the hall, the hall outside and then you have the shera, right? The street. Okay. So we're in the back area and we have three kids under the age of four. Okay. And we're in church, which is a miracle in and of itself. And we're in the very back. And if I take one step backwards, I'm in the street. Okay, so that I'm as far back as possible. And this older lady who back then was like 50-ish, which is what I am now. So I'm going to say she was 60-ish. She's standing back there. I don't know why. Okay, but she's standing there by herself. And there's room in the church. And Justin made a sound. And it was like an eighth of a second sound. You know, ah, and he yelled something in church, right? And we, I kind of turned to him and I gave him a crack or whatever it is he wanted. And she turned around and she looked at me and gave me this evil look, you know, like you need to control your kids. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't know if I've ever confessed this, so maybe I should. So I walked up to her, I got it in her face and I said, you should turn around now. And I had that look, you know, the look that parents have after three, when three kids are screaming and yelling for an hour in church and they're trying to keep you quiet, you know, that crazy look that parents have. That's the look I had. I looked at her like I was a crazy man, which I was. And I said, you should turn around now. Turn around and face that way. Don't look at me again. Right? So why did she do that to me? Because her kids are old. And what's more important, she forgot what it was like to have little kids. Why'd she forget? Because she hasn't been around little kids. Now, what if she was a grandma? And her, her kids were always, you know, saying, could you watch the kids, mom? And she's constantly watching them. You know, you see the titas and they have the little kids. Those titas don't look around at people. Who looks at the people? The, the women and the men who are older, right? Who don't have any kids and who don't have grandkids. Why? Because we forgot. Okay, what's the point of all this? When I'm repentant and I'm repenting, I remember, because I'm in the middle of it, how much it sucks and how hard it is, and how I keep falling, and how I'm broken. And it's very clear to me, those things. And so, when I see someone else who's broken, if, I don't, if I'm not repenting, then I remember myself as something else. So I'm, what's the point of this? Someone sins and there's two reactions. One looks at them and says, you're a horrible sinner. And the other one looks at them and says, Habibi, I'm so sorry. I understand. It's hard. What's the difference between those two people? I'll tell you. The one who said you're a horrible sinner doesn't repent. They've forgotten. They're cold. The candle is off. Those are the ones who condemn others. The one who puts their arm around them and said, Habibi, I understand how hard it is. They're still repenting. So what you can learn from the reaction of people is who's repenting and who isn't repenting. And the person who's still repenting, who hasn't reached the, 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 the heights, they're the ones who will have compassion on the youth, have compassion on the sinners. And the person who stands back and says, yeah, these kids, they're no good. What's wrong with them? Blah, blah, blah. I can tell you they're not repenting. They think they're righteous. And it's sad for them that they're in that position. And so I think we'll talk about this at the very end. I realize that, you know, the kids will be gone. But um, the point is what we consider what's, what's being a Christian it's not some standard of behavior. And I'll talk about this at the end, but maybe I'll bring it up now. There are atheists 
who are more moral than we are. There are atheists who give to the poor more than I do. There are atheists who are more compassionate than I am. So then what is what's good's Christianity then? And if you do you look at these studies of morality, they find that Christians and non-Christians, when they test their morality and their behavior, they find that they're the same. <laughs> they do the same things. There's no difference in outcome. So then what's the point? The point is being a Christian isn't about being having these behaviors. It's about a life with Christ as a repentant sinner. And in that life is joy that flows through the person. And that's the point. It's not to achieve certain outcomes of moralistic behavior. Because the kid, you know, teenager does one thing, adult does something, everyone does something. We're all kind of in the same boat. I don't know. Is that a good answer to your question? Any other questions? Yes. So, do friends always... It's not passive. It's not passive. Just mark what we, we say. No, we say it. So, so the question is, the world's always teaching us to take care of ourselves, to look out for ourselves, to make sure no one takes advantage of us. You know. Yeah. Be wise and and yeah and, and be like yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, and then the, then she says, but the church is telling us to give and to give and give. So, um, so the when you when you look at the story of Jesus and the ten lepers, so these ten lepers came to Jesus and he healed them, right? Does everyone remember this story? Okay, and then what happened after he healed them? They left, but then what happened? One came back, okay? And one came back to thank him. And he says, you're the only one, that, only one that came back? Where's the other nine? And so sometimes, you know, I remember hearing in Sunday school, you know, well, you see, you should thank God. Isn't that important to thank God? But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story isn't about me. The point of the story is about Christ. Because what did Christ do? He healed 10 people. And he's Christ, knowing what? That only one's going to come back. So he did 10 good deeds, knowing only 10% was going to thank him. But he did it anyway. And that's what he's trying to teach us. You just give. And that's about the right number. You, you help out 10 people, only one thanks you. And then the other nine talk badly about you behind your back. In Christianity, we're called to love and not to be loved. No one told us we're going to be loved. No one said when you do something good, people will love you. Not necessarily. In fact, starting from Christ, <laughs> we know that's not true. Christ gave love, and then they killed him for it. And the saints gave love, and they killed him for it. Pope Kirillus gave love, and he was attacked by his own bishops and his own priests, and they talked badly about him, and they... From the history of Christ to today, there hasn't been one saint, not one, who had an easy life, who didn't have someone attack him personally, stab them in the back, talk about them behind their back, say things. This is, this is what we do as Christians. This is the deal. We give, and then we get crucified. So this is what we sign up for. Now. Should I give to someone if it's not good for their salvation? That's a, maybe a different story. If I see something and I'm like, you know, every once in a while someone will, will, will do something and I think, you know, I should make a point here. Like, you know what? I don't think it's right that you said this to me, but that's okay, but I'm gonna do it anyway. You know, we do this with our children, right? When the kid comes and says, give me a cookie. We say, please, 
Can you say please? Okay, say please. All right, here's a cookie. Right? So I'll correct them to the degree that I want them to be a better person. So, but as a Christian, no one promised you you'll be loved. No one promised you'll be respected. No one promised you, you know, people won't put knives in your back. That just happens. So if I had to pick which side, I always pick the side of I'm going to give. They're going to take advantage of me. They're going to talk about me. They're going to say, see, I was right all along. I'm going to spread gossip about them. Spread. Right? St. Paul says, do not return evil for evil. Return good for evil. Chalas. Continue. Okay, so that means that I have to be wise as a serpent, right? Because there are certain people who doing these kinds of things for is not for their salvation. Okay? And so when I feel like their salvation is on the line, then it's okay for me to make a point. But that has to be the line. And it can't be karamti or, you know, my respect or my, it can't be that. It has to be your, and I mean, even, even like the, 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 the parable that Christ said, he says, take the, the splinter out of your own eye, the log out of your own eye before you see the splinter in someone else's eye, right? So what's the point of that story? If you look at the very end is the point. He doesn't say, yani tab, look at your own sins. Yani tab, what about your sins? That's not what Jesus said. He's saying. Take the splinter, the, take the log out of your eye. And then how do we finish it? So you can see clearly to take the splinter out of the eye. So even the reason I take the log out of my eye is to help my brother. Because the little splinter hurts him. So I'm going to do it for love, not because the machuf and, and that kind of attitude. No, it's so I can help. Mm -hmm. Or take the, yeah, I'm sorry. Any other questions? Any other, yes, sure. Another one from online, um, which is, um, do I have to serve, and is this talk relevant to me if I'm not a servant in the church? Okay, I wasn't going to say this, but we, from the from the liturgy of Saint Carlos, there's this beautiful phrase. He says, "Since you were pleased that we frail earthly men should also serve you, not on account of the purity of our hands, but because we have wrought goodness on not wrought because we have not wrought goodness on earth, but rather desiring to give to us, we undeserving wretches of your purity, receive us unto yourself. So why do we serve? So that God gives to us. And the person asking the question may be thinking of a limited service. Right? I'm a boy and I don't want to be a deacon. I'm a girl and I don't want to be a Sunday school teacher. I'm a girl and I don't want to cook in the kitchen, right, downstairs. Okay? That's a very limited service. That's not the service that I'm talking about. Service is everyone to everyone. Right? There are, there are cells in the body whose only job it is is to fix other cells. Like, you know, I said there's a bone cell and a liver cell and a kidney cell and a million other kinds. There are some cells that only do one thing, fix the other cells. That's a service. And there are people in this church, and no one knows who they are, and they go through the whole church, and they find problems, and they fix them. And they find the person who's lonely, and the person in need, and the person who needs food, and the person who just needs someone to talk to. You know, in the Asheya, in Becker, sorry, in, in Matins, we say the litany of the sick. And we say, those who are in prisons, those who are in distress, those who are in dungeons. Do you know anybody in prison, in dungeons, in distress? I don't know anyone in a dungeon. So who's he, who are they talking about? Who's in the dungeon? There are people in dungeons in this building right now. The dungeons of loneliness, the dungeons in their own mind, trapped in a world they can't get out of. Those are the people we have to serve. And you can't be in love with Christ, then it was, if I adopt God as my father, then I have to adopt all of you as my brothers, right? Imagine I'm an orphan in an orphanage and some guy adopts me, okay? And he says, welcome to my family. These are my three kids and you're the fourth kid. I just adopted you. And can I say, all right, you can be my dad, but these are not my brothers. No, I don't like them. They're my brothers now. 
and those three brothers are going to adopt me like a brother, right? And we hear about these stories, like the lady that just got into the Supreme Court, right? She had kids, and then she adopted more kids, and all of those became brothers. So if I adopt God as my father, I can't say, yeah, but, you know, Harvey's not my brother. Sorry. Everyone but Harvey. It doesn't work, right? And so as a family, as, 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 as the... So, so the service has to be a part of Christianity. You can't have God as your father and have that kind of love and then say, I see that person suffering and I don't care. That's impossible. Then you're not human. There's something wrong with you. And, and you certainly haven't had the love of God. You know, so these people say, I just want to go, I want to serve God, and I just want to leave, and I don't want to talk to anyone, I hate people. That's very hard. It's very hard to love God and hate people because they're in his image. You know, I, I use this example a lot and I, my kids are sick of it, right? But, you know, when I come here, right, and, and then you guys see, you know, Justin and Gregory, and you're like, hey, and you give them a big hug, right? You may not even know Justin and Gregory, okay? But you know me. And say, hey, you're Archie's son. How you doing? How's it going? And we have these awkward conversations and he goes, yeah, fine, whatever, right? And they know you're only talking to them because you know me, right? Now, what if someone shows up to the church and starts punching Gregory? Okay. And I start, and he starts, someone starts pounding on Gregory. So I walk over and I'm like, um, what are you doing? He's like, I'm punching your son. I'd be like, well, you know, I'm his dad. Like, oh yeah, I know. You're, you, I love you, man. You're, you're great. Me and you, we're tight. Hang on while I punch your son some more. I'd look at him and go, well, that, that's my son. If you're punching your son, well, now we have a problem. And he's like, no, 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 we don't have a problem. I just, I love you. We're, we're great. I'm just going to punch your son. Now I'm going to stab him. Can't. In fact, the opposite will happen. You're going to like him because you like me, even if you don't like him. I know lots of kids I don't like. Okay, many of your kids out of fiction, I don't like, right? But I only tolerate them because you're your kids, right? <laughs> I was actually thinking of Henny Loza, but that, I mean, that's another, <laughs> right? So, um, <laughs> so it's the opposite, right? If I see a kid, Sometimes I come back to, 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 to Seattle and I see some kids and I'm like, who's your dad? And they go, that's your dad. Your dad's one of my best friends. Okay. And then I give the kid a hug. I did this with Tamar's kid today. Kid doesn't even know me. He's looking at me like I'm crazy. Right. And I see him in the altar and I tickle him and I played with him and I hugged him. And he's like, you freaky bald man. <laughs> right. That's all he could think. I just saw it in his eyes looking at me. The bald man's coming near me again. I'm like, Habibi, how are you? Right. Why? Because I'm close with Tamar, I know his father, and I love his father. So without thinking, I'm going to love his son. I can't not love his son. And so this is the same way. If God's our father, you can't not love each other. Because all I see in you is the image of my dad, of your dad. Hopefully I answered that question. Another question is, uh, how about if you are under a hard trial and you feel like there is unfairness because there is a hard person who is not fair to you and you have to deal with? Well, get in line. You ain't special. You're not special. You're not special. You don't have it harder than anyone else. Sorry. We all have difficulty. We all have crosses. We all have trials. To say that means I don't trust God and I think he's messed up. All right? When you say, yeah, but everyone else doesn't have it like I have it. What does that say? God's unfair. God's unjust. God's kind of dumb because he didn't really get it right. He gave that guy a great job and a great life and he gave me something else. What's wrong with God? That's blasphemy. So the person who says, you know, if, if only I have, I have this quote in the last um, uh, talk, if only, you know, you people were treated me with respect, then I would have treated him with respect. But he didn't treat me with respect, so I'm not going to treat him with respect. That's garbage. Welcome to the club.
I mean, it started with Jesus and it hasn't really stopped since. Did it, how did he get treated? So, no, you don't, ha you don't have a, an, an unfair advantage over the rest of us. Get in line. You're just like the rest of us. Sorry, I know that was kind of harsh person online, but... Uh, so, Mark, so yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, it depends. Can, can it you depends. Recap? You're saying, well, what would I do? What, can you recap what you're yeah, saying? What, what exactly do I do with that person, right? Some, some practical advice as what to do. So today I was thinking uh, during the liturgy about why we pray for people. And I, I, was, I was like, why am I, why am I praying for anybody? Like, imagine, you know, I'm praying that Tamar repents, okay? And Tamar's, yeah, we all know Tamar's not a good person, right? So we're, we're saying, I, I pray that he repents. And then I think to myself, why am I praying for him to repent? Like, as if, as if God wants him to, you know, as if I'm going to tell God, who of course wants him to repent, to repent. And then God's going to say, oh, Mark wants Tamar to repent. Then I'll move Tamar's heart. And get him to repent because Mark said so. Right? It's not, it doesn't make sense. Right? Of course, God already wants him to repent more than I do because God loves him more than I do. I really don't like Tamar that much. So what's going on? Why am I praying for Tamar? Because when I pray for Tamar, I feel Tamar. I feel his pain. Say Tamar is my jerk boss. Okay? And instead of hating him, I pray for him. Now I start to relate to him as a human. Okay, and actually I, I, I'm going to talk about this in the last class. The last, I said this, all this is going to be kind of the last uh, talk. But I'll, I'll give you guys, I'll tell you guys this uh, story, right? Imagine, you know, when, when someone is, has the flu, okay, and your child has the flu, and they're in bed, and they're fever, and they're cold, mama, I want this, I want water, I want soup, I want blah, 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 right? Does anyone walk in to the kid with the flu and say, look at you. Why can't you get your own water? Why don't you get your own soup? Why don't you make me some breakfast? Does anyone say that? Or look at you. You're disgusting. You're sweaty. You're gross. You're coughing. Does anyone say that? No. When someone has the flu, what do we do? Even if I don't normally get you soup, which I don't do anything in my house. That day, I'll get soup. I'll get you water. How, should I turn up the heat? Are you too cold? Are you too hot? What can I do for you? Do you want me to read you a story? I'm going to go huh, above and beyond because why? That person is sick. Okay? So when someone's sick in my house, I go above and beyond. I do more. And this comes back to the first thing Bishoy said. Do I give someone sick? I give more. When someone is spiritually sick, I give more. I don't hold back. I don't say, no, no, no. You've got to start working on yourself, your own salvation. You need to start figuring this out. Now's the time when I see someone who has an anger problem, a control problem, a whatever problem. I give more. I love more. You know, they, you know sometimes I'll bring some, some drink to my son who's sick, and he'll say, oh, this is too cold. I hate it. Don't you know anything? And he'll yell at me. I'm sorry, Habibi. No problem. Right now is not the time for me to say, listen, I'm bringing you soup. You have the flu. You better respect me. Right. This is not the time for a fight. Someone yells at me for giving him something. The soup's too cold. I'm sorry. Habib. I'll microwave it. Sukut, calm. I'll go microwave it and I'll bring it back to you. Why? You're sick and you're, you're on edge and you're tired and you're anxious and you're, you have problems. Okay. So when someone is spiritually sick in our life, then we have to love more, accommodate more, forgive more. That they needed the most. Christ came for those people the most. You know, it's like when you have several kids and one of them is the problem. Who gets all the attention? Who gets all the love? Who gets all the incentive? Who gets all of the things? The hardest one, right? Sometimes the other kids go, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and sometimes the other kids go, that's not fair. I get straight A's. 
right? And I didn't get anything. And this kid got a C plus, right? And you're like, yeah, but he didn't get an F. Is that great? Johnny didn't get an F, so I'm going to give him a new car because he got a C, right? And you're like, I get straight A's. Why not? Okay, because he's the one who needs. Yep. I think we're gone too long, but any other questions, comments? Glory be to God for everyone. I don't know what the schedule is. So I think we'll take a 10 or 15 minute break um, and then we'll start with talk two uh, and we'll pause the stream and then come back for those who are online.
Okay, reminder to those who are watching um, online that you can submit questions or comments through the form. Send an email and it's on the Facebook page as well. Okay. Um, all right, let's uh, continue. So we're going to switch the order a little bit and uh, talk to uh, serving, loving others. And then we'll finish with the talk on, on spiritual raising spiritual children, which I think the young people don't want to hear right now, although they probably should hear at some point in their lives, but that's more for the parents. Okay, so um, this is kind of related to the service. Okay, you guys are going to sit down slowly. They got shamed into it. They're still here, but they're going to be in the back. So that way when they leave, no one notices. It's good. It's a good strategy. That's what I would do. Um, so this is from the Gospel of, of, of John. This is at the very end after the resurrection. George, you paying attention or are you on a Zoom call? When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, what did, what did Peter do? Does anyone know? What did Peter do right before the resurrection, before the crucifixion? He denied, right? And then what else did he do? Nathan, what else did he do? He cursed and swore three times that he did not know Christ. Okay. Now, who's the very first person Christ visits after the resurrection? Peter. Okay. So what's he doing? He knows Peter is what? When someone treats you badly, what do we do? Huh? You give them the silent treatment. I saw that, Shinoda. You have to rabbi, right? You have to teach him a lesson. You have to show them, I'm upset with you. How do I do that? I'm not going to speak to you. What if someone betrays you? What do you do? You don't speak to them. In this case, Peter denies him. What do you do? I'm not going to speak to him. What did Christ do? First person he spoke to after the resurrection, he goes right to Peter. Why? Because he knows Peter feels like garbage. And so the first person he goes is Peter. And what does he say? Simon, son of John, you know, his name is Peter, Simon, Simon, Peter. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Feed. Then Jesus said, feed my lambs. Okay, that's number one. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. That's number two. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? Right? When someone keeps asking you the same question, they don't believe your answer. <laughs> he said, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And if the answer is yes, feed my, my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. So again, the order is very clear. If you love me, you will feed my sheep. So this gets back again to the question that uh, Bishoy read to us from the internet saying, do I have to serve? If you love me, you will feed my sheep. It's just a natural consequence. So these are some very important things. And this is some of the stuff that came up with uh, Mira and uh, some of the stuff Bishoy read from the internet. This is a very beautiful quote. I want you all to, I know you guys can't read it in the back. Hopefully you can. Oh, you have screens back there. That's a good idea. Never confuse the person formed in the image of God with the evil that is in him. A devilish, uh, oh, sorry, because evil is but a chance misfortune, an illness, a devilish reverie. But the very essence of the person is the image of God. And this remains in him despite every disfigurement. So don't confuse the person with the evil. Don't confuse the person with the evil. Okay? Because sometimes when someone does something to us, who did something to us? That person. Right? So I see George Ayed. He does something to me like he always does. And I think, I hate George Ayed. Right? Which is a very common thing that most people say. <laughs> and and then, then I think, why? Because George Ayed is evil. Well, hang on. We're going to talk about George here for a bit. 
Maybe George isn't evil. Maybe he is being swayed by the evil one. So one of the saints writes, and this is you know not very uh, you know uh, this is not a very Seattle thing to say. Um, have, have any of you ever thrown a rock at a dog? A dog, throwing a rock at a dog. Okay, good. Right. So anyone from Egypt has thrown rocks at dogs. That's just what you do. Okay. So y'all, you PETA people and animals. Okay, we throw rocks at dogs. Right. So what happens when you throw a rock at a dog? Does anyone know what the dog does? What does the dog do, Tamer? He, he runs away. He could run away. But sometimes, what does a dog do? He what? Uh, he turns and he bites the rock. Right? So you hit the dog. Dog gets hit. He looks. He sees the rock. He bites the rock. And he doesn't put together that you're the one throwing the rock. Right? He goes after the rock, not the person throwing the rock. So this saint says that we sometimes... Bite the rock. Who's the rock? George Ayed. So George Ayed. Right? So George Ayed does something to me. Okay? And I turn and I look at him and I want to attack him. But he's not the one doing. He's the image of God. He's God's son. And when I accepted God as my father, I accepted him as my brother. Anytime, George. So. The evil that's coming out of George isn't from George. What does St. Paul say? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, huh? but against principalities, dominions, and all powers of the adversary. Who are we fighting with? We don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against people. We fight against Satan. And Satan moves people to do things. And so when I see someone doing something evil, I don't say, ah, that person is so bad. I say, Satan has really fooled that person. Satan is using that person. Satan is tricking that person, that poor, poor person. You know what I have to do? I'm going to pray for that person. And the worse they are, the more I see Satan, not that person. And so this is how I can distinguish when someone hurts me and takes advantage of me and as I said in, in uh, you know, get in line when your mean boss is extra mean. And this is how I distinguish. That's not the person who hurt me. Satan who's using him. So he says, never confuse the two. This is a very similar story, so I won't, I won't get into it. But basically, <laughs> it's a very similar story. So I'll, I'll uh, Let me read it to you. So let's suppose someone's alone in the desert and he hears a voice crying out in distress in the distance. He follows the sound and is confronted by a horrendous sight. A tiger has grabbed hold of a man and is killing the man. The man is shouting for help. Help me, the tiger is killing me. In a few minutes, he'll be torn to pieces. What can the person do to help? Can he run to his side? How? It's impossible. The tiger. Can he shout for help? Who's going to hear him? He's in the middle of nowhere. There is no one within earshot. Maybe he should get a stone and throw it at the man and finish him off. That's ridiculous. Certainly not, we would say. But that's exactly what can happen if we don't realize that the other person who is acting badly towards us has been taken hold by a tiger, the devil. And we fail to realize that when we react to such a person without love, it is as if we are throwing stones at his wounds. And accordingly, we are doing him great harm. And the tiger, and here's the funny part, after he's done with the man, leaps onto us. Because we threw stones at the wrong thing. We didn't try to kill the tiger. We tried to kill the person. And after we killed the person with our gossip and with our talk and with our anger, then the lion leaves him and jumps on us. And that is the order of things. This is a quote. Every time I read this quote, I get choked up. Let the mouth fast from disgraceful and harsh words, because what gain is there when on one hand we avoid eating chicken and fish, and on the other hand we chew up and consume our brothers with words? 
in another in another place, Saint John Chrysostom says, you know, you fast Lent, and you don't eat meat, but yet you eat the flesh of your brother with words. So you're fasting from chicken, but you have no problem being a cannibal and eating up everyone around you and talking about them and gossiping them about them and ruining their lives and destroying their reputations and hurting them and trying to almost get them. Difficulty in service. I love this quote. And this is kind of back to Bishoy's internet question. There never was and never will be a place on earth free from sorrows. Should I say it again? There never was and never will be a place on earth free from sorrows. The only sorrowless place possible is in the heart when the Lord is present. That's it. So if you're looking for a place on earth to be free from sorrow, where there's no pain and there's no judgment and there's no anxiety and there's, it's not here. You can look at the commercials and you think it's Hawaii, but it's not Hawaii. It's not Aruba. It's not whatever island with the, with the fruity drink and the umbrella. All those are pretty good. Okay. That, that's not the place. There's no place on earth. And we, we spend our whole lives looking for it. And everyone's advertising to us to sell it to us. And he's saying the only place it is, is inside when God is there. Like we said before, the kingdom of heaven is where? Inside you. So if you're looking for a place without misery, it doesn't exist. So difficulty in service is always there. That's just the way it is. That's what comes with the territory. So I love this quote. <clears throat> it's kind of long, but I'll read it to you slowly. And this is, I, I started saying this quote earlier when people were asking me questions. Sometimes we find ourselves at odds with another person and we stubbornly insist he is at fault. He's the one who became angry. He's the one who spoke to me rudely. He must humble himself, not me. How many times have we said this? Weekly. I say this about George Ayed almost every week. If he, had not, if he had spoken to me calmly and addressed me with respect, I would have been patient and not have been offended. So he's to blame. This is what Mira says. Behold the passion of egotism. Who's the ego? The person who's saying, had he been respectful to me, I'd be patient. But he wasn't respectful, so I'm not patient. And he's condemning this person. He says, we must oppose such thoughts by responding, no, no. If I did not have an ego, I would not be bothered. When someone speaks to me without respect, how does it affect me? Do I say, do you know who I am? Karamti? Ahtarami? My respect, or demines, is this? What is that? That's my ego. That's my ego talking. Right? Hence, I am to blame. My brother is not at fault. Listen to this. So my brother spoke to me without respect. Okay? And he, and he's saying the brother is not at fault. If I had humility, I would take this opportunity to gain a crown. See? So someone speaks to me without respect, it's an opportunity, forza, to get a crown. And I would view this person as Jesus' cauterizing instrument. You know when something is cauterized, it's like, the, it's like a hot thing that they use to, 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 to seal uh, veins and things like that, burning stuff, to seal it, to fix it. He says, this person is Jesus' cauterizing instrument. So it's a hot thing that burns but fixes. He is cauterizing my passion so I can become healthy. So the person that's speaking rude to me is what? He's a gift. He's a gift. He is cauterizing my passion so I can become healthy. He is helping me now. He is my benefactor. I must embrace him, love him, and pray for him because he actually did me a favor by revealing my sickness. So going back to the person, what if I have a jerk boss, I have joy. What if I have a mean boss? What if I have a whatever? They're doing me a favor. He revealed my sickness. If he didn't speak to me in that manner, then, and if this temptation had not happened, I would have remained unaware 
of the extensive egotism within me. And I would have never realized that I need to struggle against it. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like you go to the doctor and he does an MRI and he says, I'm sorry, you have cancer. And then you go and you punch the doctor in the face. You say, how dare you say that to me? And he's like, you know, I, I'm just the messenger. You didn't need to punch me in the face. He says, well, yeah, but, you know, and, and then he says, but, you know, if I hadn't told you you had cancer, you wouldn't have tried to fix it. But now you know. Now we're going to do chemo. Now we're going to do radiation. Now we're going to do this experiment, whatever. But now we can fight it. Okay? So when someone comes to you and all of a sudden you have a reaction, what is that? There's a pocket of ego still there. Okay? And God sends these people to us to expose it to us. Because sometimes, all the time, we don't see it. We just don't see it. And I've been in so many situations personally where someone does something. You know, I talk about service a lot. I'm the Amin Khidma, so I'm always talking to the servants that it's okay, Hadi, they didn't mean that, they mean this, don't do this, don't worry about that. Ah, this is our job, right? And then it happened to me once. And I didn't see it coming. And I was like, whoa. And then someone said to me, Mark, I mean, Khidma, you know, sometimes people are like that. It's okay. Head the, blah, blah. And I'm like looking at him like, what do you, th I say this to you. That's my job. I've said this a million times. How come it's happening to me? How can it happen to me? And then I realized God sent this, this surgical strike. And he said, ah, there's a pocket right there. And I'm just going to pop. And it's going to blow up in your face. And then what are you going to see? Your own ugliness. You're going to see it. And no one likes to see their own ugliness. Because it's ugly. But God shows us this ugliness so that we can work on it. He says, if I had not been spoken to in this manner, and if this temptation had not transpired, I would have remained unaware. And the most dangerous diseases is what? The ones you don't know about. Why is cancer such a bad disease? Because it sits in your body for years undetected. Those are the diseases that get you, right? The cold, no problem. Flu, you show symptoms. You can get, you can get, unless it's COVID, whatever, right? But when, it, when a disease has a symptom and there's a fever, okay, there's a problem. We'll take antibiotics. We can fix it. Cancer stays hidden. The hidden ones are the ones that kill you. Those are the ones where you all of a sudden go to the doctor and say, you have six weeks to live. Okay? And so the this, this spiritual diseases are like that. God sends us these people to poke. Right? Usually there are spouses. And the spouses are very good at that. Right? And they do the exact wrong thing. Right? The exact thing that pisses you off. And that's what your spouse does. And it's almost like God's giving a striking. Right? And every once in a while you, you hear a man say, you know, I could handle anything. I just want to be treated with respect. That's the one thing I asked her. The one thing. And she wouldn't give it to me. And you're like, glory be to God. Because that's the one problem you have. And God sent you bint al-halal to make sure that she never speaks to you <laughs> with respect until you get that fixed. Thank God. The sting of this temptation uncovered my sickness. And now that I've seen it, I will make sure I apply the medication in order to be healed. So whenever there's a, a confrontation, it exposes, exposes the heart. And then you got to look at it. You know, it's a problem. Got to work on that. And the battle goes where? With the other person? What do we say? It goes within. Now the battle goes in. And now the fight is with me. When someone humiliates me, there's a fight. It's me against me. Why are you humiliated? Why do you have such a big ego? Are you really better than that? He can't talk to you that way? Well, you aren't you this and that? And I start fighting with Mark. And it's quite a conversation. To summarize, the Christian servant is not a, just a teacher of lessons, but is in the first place a leader of souls to salvation. The first priority and central preoccupation of Christian service is to lead the souls of men and women to repentance and to train the young in the paths of virtue and the fear of God. It is not to give information. It is not to do lessons. It's not to do activities. 
It's to lead them to their souls to heaven. Okay, so I want to talk about what it is to be a Christian. And I want to talk about this concept of being versus doing. So I want to read you this, these verses. Anyone ever heard these verses before? Where are they located? Eh. Matthew, which, what's, the, what's the, the, the passage in the Bible? The Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And these, these eight things here are called what? 5, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I have six of them. Not bad. Six out of eight. What are these called? Huh? The Beatitudes. And what chapter are they in? Five, the first chapter. So if you want, they say that it's like the New Testament is the, the, the heart of the, gospel, of the whole Bible. And they said that the, the Sermon on the Mount is the constitution of the Christian. And they say the Beatitudes is the focus of the Sermon on the Mount. So these Beatitudes are amazing. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecute for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what do you guys think of this? When I read this, what am I supposed to do with this? When you read this, what are you supposed to do with this? Does it mean I'm supposed to be meek and hunger and thirst and be merciful and pure in heart and peacemaker and persecuted? So does that mean, okay, I got to be meek, I have to be meek, be meek, be meek, uh, be merciful, be merciful, be pure in heart, be pure in heart. Is that what that means? Maybe. Hmm? Examining yourself. So these are the rules of being a Christian, the constitution, okay? But maybe there's more to the rules than just do these things. Maybe these aren't prescriptions for us to be like a robot. I'm supposed to be this, 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 this. Maybe the Lord is telling us about who he is. Let's read him again. The meek, hunger and thirst for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemaker, persecuted for righteousness sake. Sounds like whom? Sounds like, like Jesus. And so maybe Christ is telling us, this is who I am. Okay. So are these commandments telling us how to act or is it telling us about who God is? Are they commandments? Are they rules? For example, he told Peter, he said, you need to forgive seven times, 70 times. Remember this story? Who's, who's he talking to? Who's he talking about? Is he telling Peter, you need to forgive 490 times? What's he saying? So Christ came for our salvation, right? And this is a big part of why Christ came. But also he came for another reason. There's a misconception among the Jews about who God is. Because the Jews thought God was a rule guy. He gave rules and you did the rules. He said, do this and you did this. If you do this, you go to heaven. Okay? And this is... Really, George? And this is... This is... Um, and this is a misconception by the Jews. Is it a misconception we have now? Yeah, same kind of problem. I do the things and then God sends me to heaven. God wants me to do these things. And so when he told Peter, forgive seven times, 70 times, he wasn't really telling Peter to forgive seven times, 70 times. What was he saying? I forgive seven times, 70 times. That's who I am. That's what I do. What are you going to do, Peter? Whatever you want. Didn't Paul, St. Paul say, all things are lawful to you, but not all things are helpful? Do we have laws in the church? Let's continue. I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I was naked and you clothed me. What is this passage telling us? Is this what we need to do to earn heaven? We need to do these good things. Good people do these things. Visit the sick, visit the homeless, visit the orphans, visit those in prison. Is that what that's saying? If you do that, I will take you to heaven. If you do this, I'll give you that. Is that what it's saying? It's not. These, are, these 
these things that God tells us, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed, he's not saying you have to do those things. He's saying, I'm that. Okay? I'm that. Are you my son? If you are, you'll be like me. So these, these things, these acts of service, they're not, we don't earn heaven with acts. There's nothing you can do, I'll just tell you right now, that's going to earn you to heaven. That's a gift from God. That's not something we work for. So what's he saying all these things? He's saying, if you live with me, you'll be like this. So when I take someone's temperature and they have a fever, what's the problem? Is it the fever? Is that the problem? What does the doctor say? Oh my gosh, you have a fever. We have to stop the fever. What's the solution to a fever? Antibiotics. Why? Because there's a virus inside that's causing the fever. The fever is not the problem. The fever is a measure of another problem. Make sense? These acts are not the goal. They're not the outcome. They're not, you're supposed to do those things. Those, these acts are a measure of a life with God. So when he tells Peter, forgive seven times, 70 times, he's not saying, look, if you don't want to forgive, I mean, I can't force you. Okay. Because you know, we've all tried to forgive someone and you can't. Correct. You just can't. And so, you know, you can say, I got to forgive. I got to, it's not going to work. But if I live with God, then I will forgive seven times, 70 times. If I live with God, I will feed the hungry and I will visit the poor and I will visit the sick. These are measures of my life with God. So what's the real thing that we're talking about? Is it the measures or is it the life with God? It's the life with God. That's the thing. It's not the measures. Make sense? It's the virus, not the fever. Right? These are outcomes of a life. You know, it's like... You forget your wife's birthday. And she goes, and she's upset. She goes, I can't believe you forgot my birthday. You're like, okay, fine. Uh, you, okay, what do you want me to do? You want me to remember your birthday. You want me to say I love you. You want me to uh, do the dishes. Uh, tell me all the things you want me to do, and I'll do them. And what does your wife say? I'm not going to tell you what I want you to do. If you loved me, you would have remembered my birthday. Okay. If you loved me, you would just do these things. They come naturally. And if you say, okay, give me a list of eight things and I'll do the eight things. I don't want your eight things. I want you to love me. So your wife isn't hurt because you forgot her birthday or your girlfriend or your whatever, because you forgot her birthday. She's hurt because that means you don't love her. Does that make sense? And the real problem is the lack of love. Not that, you know, she'll even tell you, I don't care about my birthday but you forgot it. You're not even thinking about me. That's what stings. Make sense? So the real thing is the love or the lack of love. This is God's relationship with us. He's not looking for the things. He's looking for the love, right? He's looking for the heart. That's what he wants. And then if you happen to be merciful and pure in heart and, uh, you know, visit the poor and okay, fine. And if you don't, you don't. And some people do this and some people do that. Fine. No problem. There's no list of things I'm supposed to do. God's looking for the heart and that's it. We give the heart and the things come. But if you try to go backwards and you try to say, okay, okay, I'll do the things. Tell me what, what, tell me what you want me to do. I don't need anything from you. Does God need anything from us? What do we say in the Gregorian liturgy? In the Eid? Of course, we're all sleepy and we want to eat feta. But Abuna says, you do not have, you do not have need of our service, but we have need of your Lordship. You do not have need of our service. Does God need you? No. Right? When I ask my, my son to help me build something, right? When my, Justin's heard this example many times, right? I ask him, you know, he's four years old and I say, here, come help daddy build this new toy. Do I need his help? No. Is he going to help me? No. He's going to cause more problems. 
He's going to get the wrong screw in. I'm going to have to hold his hand above all these things. So then why am I asking him to help me? Because I want to teach him how to build something. I don't need his help. It's faster without you. All right? So we don't, God doesn't need our service. We need the service. Because that's when God holds my hand and says, I want you to turn like this. See how this screw is going in crooked? You have to straighten it and then you turn it. And I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to show you how much pressure to apply as you twist. And you're going to figure out how to do this. Like, ah, now I learned. Why? Because I'm holding God's hand and we're serving together. Who's learning? Who's benefiting? It's not God. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need me. And as soon as you think God needs me, you know, like one of the things I don't like is when people say, you know, tell the youth we need them. They're the future of the church. You're not needed. When they say the church needs you. No, it doesn't. You need the church. You know, I, the church needs your support. The church needs your, no, it doesn't. The church is the body of Christ. The gates of hell will never, never prevail against it. You need the church. And, it, and, and the heart is how it starts. God doesn't need these actions. God will feed those poor people without you. God will feed, you see it, I feed the birds. You don't think I can feed these people? I created the poor people so that you can go to heaven. This is what St. John Chrysostom says. God created poor people so that the rich people can go to heaven. I don't need you to feed them. I'll feed them. I can feed them right now. I can fix the whole thing right now. There's a story about Ember Wiz, one of my favorite stories about Ember Wiz. I tell the story all the time. He's, you know, Ember Wiz was a, a homeless guy, basically. He sold salt on the back of his camel. His camel's name was Tiji. And so he's sitting kind of on the side of the street, and he's like a homeless guy, but people knew he was a saint. Some people knew. Anyway, the soldier was walking by. He's in the 14th century, and he felt sorry for Ember Wiz. So he gave him a piece of bread. Right? He goes, here you go. So Ember Wiz looked at him, and he goes, thank you. And he says, give me your napkin. So the soldier gave him his napkin. Ember Wiz took some sand from the ground, put it in the napkin, and twisted it. And said, here you go. Open it. So the soldier opened it. It was gold coins. And Ember Wiz said, just so that you know that my poverty is, isn't real poverty. I choose this poverty, but I follow the one who's rich. So what Ember Wiz is telling the soldier, look, God, he can make money out of the sand. He can make money out of the sand. Your heart, that love you showed me, that's what God was looking for. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your service. We need. Okay. He who busies himself with the sins of others or judges his brother on suspicion and this is hard to hear, has not yet even begun to repent or to examine himself so as to discover his own sins. You know, when you enter a hospital and you have cancer and the doctor says you have six weeks to live and you're in the room and you're getting chemo and your hair is falling out, let's keep going there, and then you kind of get out of your room and you walk around and you see someone in another room and they have whatever, pneumonia. Imagine looking at that person and going, man, you're messed up. You're, you have pneumonia. Yeah, that's horrible. That sucks. You suck. Because that person looks at you and goes, don't you have cancer? Yeah, but my disease isn't as disgusting as yours. Your disease is disgusting. Look at you. He's like, well, you're going to die in six weeks. I'm going to get over this. It's like, yeah, but. So imagine I walk into the church and I have my cancer. And I look at your pneumonia and your broken leg and your whatever, your gout, <laughs> your heart disease. And I go, you guys are messed up. You're so sick. What he's saying is you haven't even begun to repent. That means you don't even know you have cancer. 
Because if you have cancer, you're not thinking about anyone else. You're going to the doctor and you're saying, I need my chemo, I need my radiation, I need surgery, I need fix me, get this fixed, right? If you have cancer, that's your instinct. It's not to walk around and judge other people's medical conditions. So the only time when you see someone else judging another person, it means one thing. They don't know they have cancer. Because if you did, you wouldn't be doing that. You couldn't even start to look at someone else's sins. If someone said, you know what that person over there did? You're like, who cares? Do you know what I did this morning? I don't care about him. Forgive me. I don't care about what he did. I got my own problems. I got a long list of them. I'm not interested in what the guy in the back row did or what the, the Metropolitan did or what the Pope said or what someone, who cares? Have you, have you met me? Have you seen me? Have, have, you, have I exposed the inner side of myself? Have I told you what I think sometimes? Do you want to look at that? And you're going to tell me the guy in the back row cheated on his taxes? Whatever. So when we judge each other, it means we haven't even started to look at ourselves. Because you can't. If you're really looking at yourself, it's very easy not to judge. Very easy. Right? I mean, and when you have to say to yourself, okay, I can't judge people. I can't judge people. I can't. Something's wrong. Because if you're really looking at you, you don't have to fight very hard. It's kind of like being humble. Right? I, I say this, you know, in LA, LeBron James on the Lakers. And I, I truly believe Jesus does not love LeBron James, but that's not important. That's a side issue. So if I go play basketball with LeBron, okay, and we play one on one, and he beats me, which he might. And I say, you know, guys, LeBron James is really good at basketball. Everyone would look at me like, yeah. And then if I said, yeah, isn't that humble of me to say that? Aren't I humble that I think LeBron is better than me? And they're like, no, that's not humble. That's just true. That's just a fact. That doesn't take, that doesn't take humility. That just means you, you realize, okay? Humility is like that. You can't make yourself humble. You just have to be aware. Right? You just have to be conscious. Because if you're aware, then you can't be anything but humble. If you're aware of your sins, how could you be anything but humble? If you're aware of God's goodness relative to your goodness, of God's awesomeness, I mean, humility isn't an action we create. It's a state of being from the reality. When I live with God, all I can be is humble. If I'm playing basketball with LeBron every day, I'm very humble. Not sin. It's just because I'm, you know, not stupid. That's the only thing that keeps you humble. So awareness, self-awareness of my own problems makes me a very humble person. Because I can't judge anybody. Because I got a long list and I don't, I don't have time to judge anyone. Buddha Metta goes back and he says, learn from me for I am gentle and lonely in heart. The lesson of love can never be taught by prearranged words and anecdotes. Rather, it is taught by truly giving yourself and communicating the love. Oh, I already said this one. Oh, no, I didn't. Love and longing for Christ to those you serve. The lesson of humility cannot be taught by intellectual persuasion. I said this one. But by prolonged and bitter struggle against one's ego. Okay, I'll just continue. Okay, so let's get to our the point, and then we can end. What's the goal of Christianity? The goal of Christianity is an absorption into Christ, to be absorbed. As, as St. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, eh, but Christ who lives in me. I'm not even, it's not me anymore. It's just Christ. So what's the outcome of this absorption into Christ, this heart, as I was saying earlier? It could be morality. It could be helping the poor. It could be serving others. It could be isolation and solitude. I could be a hermit. All of those are outcomes. Mother Teresa is an outcome of living with God. And so is Avan Ofer, who lived as an anchorite and a hermit in the middle of nowhere. Both of those are outcomes. This is the stem cell phenomena. You don't know how you end up. That's not your choice. That's not your call. 
right? All you do is you live with God. And then whatever happens, happens. So can someone be moral and not Christian? We talked about this. Someone help the poor, someone serve others and not be Christian. Can someone live in solitude and be a hermit and not be Christian? Sure. So in fact, and we talked about this too, there's studies that show that Christians and non-Christians pretty much have the same morality. If you look at their outside behavior, it's about the same. So does that mean Christianity doesn't work? Does that mean it failed? Does that mean that the person isn't going to heaven? No, because it isn't the morality and the service and the isolation per se that leads to heaven. It's the outcome of a different process, which does. It's the putting on of Christ. That's the process. That's what we have to stay very focused on. If you focus on the services and the things and the activities, it won't lead you far. Because as soon as someone eh, pokes you a little bit, you go, okay, I'm out. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sick of this. Right? But if the focus is on I'm going to put on Christ and I'm going to be absorbed by Christ and I'm going to be absorbed in Christ, and then whatever happens, happens. Now it's a very different process. Right? In, in the prayer of baptism, I'm sure all of you have attended baptisms other than your own. There's a beautiful prayer Abuna says where he says we are grafted into the body of Christ. You know, we know when you graft something, anyone here take botany? Right? You take a, a branch from a tree, a different tree, you cut it, and then you graft it into this other tree. Right? And you kind of do a certain process and you put it into the other tree. And then the life of the first tree will go into the life of the second tree and the branch. Okay, and they will they will graft a branch of one of one tree into the, another. Okay, and this is what we do. We have this tree of life, right? And each of us gets grafted in to the tree of life. And the best thing you can do is make sure the connection is strong. You know, is it a peach tree? Is it a peach branch? Is it an apple branch? Are the leaves brown? Are they deciduous? Are they evergreen? Who cares? The only thing you can do is hold on to the tree. You're the branch. Right? And Jesus said, when the branch gets cut, it withers and dies. So the Eucharist is this grafting into the, the baptism is grafting. And then the Eucharist is the feeding of the tree of, of, excuse me, of life into the branches. And we seek this life and we do other things, not because we want the pearly gates of heaven, but because it's the only life of happiness. The one who serves is happier than the one who doesn't serve. The one who is moral is more content with their life. The one who sits around and is selfish, like who's happier? The person who's selfish or the person who isn't selfish? Have you met a selfish person and you met someone who's not selfish? Which one's happier? The selfish one is complaining, is miserable, self-centered. One of the saints says, you know, when you take a piece of wood and you plane it, you, you shave a piece of wood, what does the world would do? It curls, right? It'll just curl. I don't see this like shavings of wood. Am I the only one? I know Mike has, right? So you shave wood and it curls. And he says, the selfish people are like those shavings of wood. They curl around themselves and they're empty inside, right? But yet they're so selfish. They're not happy, right? Because this is not the life that God wanted us to have. He didn't make you to be selfish. He made you to be part of a body, which works with the other parts of the body. And when the parts of the body work together, it succeeds together and we're all happy, right? No one's ever going to say, wow, the heart is really healthy. That pisses me off. Look how well the brain is doing. You know, I'm just a liver and I'm not getting all the attention the brain's getting. I'm going to be upset. Can't be upset at someone else's service. Can't be upset when another part of the body succeeds. Let the other part succeed. Let it be a great heart and a great brain and a great kidney. Let it. Does it hurt you when the kidney does well? Can it? Aren't you part of the same body? You know, when, when, when you watch boys turn 14, they do this, they have a tradition of each other. They punch each other in the arm 14 times, right? On your birthday. I'm 50. No, I'm not interested in getting punched. Thank you. No, thank you. Right? So you get punched a number of times at your birthday, right? And you know, we've all had these friends who aren't really good friends and they start punching you really hard in your arm. Okay. And then your arm starts getting sore, right? After about five or six, you're like, okay, I'm kind of done with getting punched in the arm, okay? So now this shoulder hurts, right? Now what does this hand do? What does this hand do? It covers the arm. Now what happens to the hand? It gets punched. Is that okay? 
will this hand ever say, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm not getting punched. I'm going to stay over here like this while the shoulder gets it. The hand can't see the shoulder in pain and not cover it. It doesn't work. Why? They're both connected to the same head. Christ is the head. So if I want this arm and this arm to work together better, right, and this arm and this arm aren't getting along well, should I, and I want these two arms to get closer to each other, how do I do that? Can I cut this arm off and stick it closer to here so they're close? Or do I let both arms get closer to the head? The more in tune the arms are in with the head, the more they work together. Now this arm and this arm, they're working together. Why? They're both connected to Christ. And as long as everyone connects, focuses on the connection to Christ, everything works because we've all got the same brain, right? And all of a sudden you see a man doing surgery with microscopic, you know, like not microscopic, you know, tiny little movements with his hand. His two hands are working together perfectly to do brain surgery. And you're like, wow, and glory to God, right? That these two hands that are very far apart are working together. Why? They're connected to the same brain. That's how we serve. Does anybody have any questions? I'll stop and see if you guys are bored or tired or sick, upset. Maybe. Do not lose your temper with those who sin. Do not have a passion for noticing every sin in your neighbor and judging it, as we usually do. <laughs> this guy must be Coptic. He's not. Everyone will give an answer for himself before God. Especially, do not look with evil intention on the sins of those older than you, with whom you have no business. We love to do this too. But correct your own sins and your own heart. This may seem like simple advice, but I wish it was advice we took. Don't look to the sins of others. Correct your own heart. Because in the end, that's the one that's going to be judged. That's the one that you'll have to give an answer before God to. I don't have to give an answer about George's heart. Alhamdulillah. Right? I don't need to worry about him that much. I don't even like him. Okay. And then I have this quote that I, I got. It's a really nice quote from Abu Nadud Lamai. Oh, question, sorry. Um, <clears throat> someone says, 100% agree that the church doesn't need us as servants, and we are the ones who need... Christ, uh, how do you bring others to the realization that they need Christ? You don't. You just do. Um, one of the most important tenets of humans is that we can't change other people. You're not going to change anybody, especially by force, right? You can't. You can't even like you know. There, there are people that get married. And the woman, the girls always do this for some reason. They want to marry a bad boy, right? And then they're like, I'm going to change him. I'm going to domesticate him. He's wild. He's bad. But I'm going to make him wash dishes. Okay? And they have these fantasies of, of marrying these bad boys and changing, right? What happens? He doesn't change. They get divorced. She lives a bitter life. Okay? So many people have gotten married thinking they're going to change the other person and they spend decades trying to change the other person and then they fail, right? Just, you know, ask your parents, mama, did you change Baba? Right? And she'll complain for 45 minutes. Right? So you can't even change the person closest to you and you can't, and it's even hard to change yourself. I mean, I've been working on myself for a couple of decades now, and it's not going very well. Okay. And I'm trying and I'm failing and I do the same thing. And so even changing me is very hard. Now imagine when they tell the young people, go change the world. Really? Let's end racism. Let's end hatred. Let's end injustice. You can't end hatred and injustice in yourself. You think you're going to change everybody? And you do that by holding a sign? Okay. So let's go back to the question. How do I make others realize what I know? 
Well, you sound like you're kind of elitist. You sound like you seem to think you're better than the other person. It doesn't sound like you're two ants on the ground walking. You sound like you think you're a bumblebee. And he's just an ant. And he doesn't know what I know. So you don't need to. You just need to work. Get in the line. Carry the crumb of bread. Just walk back to the hive. Put it there and then walk back. And you can't look at the other ants and say, you know, you're not working very hard. You don't realize how important this is. You need to save it. No one's listening. No one cares. Save the speeches. Just do. Right? They'll see you. And maybe this year they won't. Maybe next year they won't. But I can tell you, as an old man who's 50, I remember the few servants in my church who served with love. I remember them. I remember the way they stood in the liturgy. I remember their tears. I remember their heart. I remember their love. And they didn't need to say a word. I remember the guy who made the Orban, the old man, and the way he served, and the way he sweated, and the way he loved, and the way he smiled. He never gave a talk. Right, so how do I convince others to, that's not your job. Your job is to be light, the light of the world. Okay? You be light, and you let everybody else do their thing. I'm not going to force you to be light. You should be light like me. See my light. See how big my light is. Your light's bigger than my light. Here we go. Now we're just silliness. Just be the light that God called you to be. Then let them, you know, there's a story by, uh, I was going to tell the story, but I'll tell in the next talk. <laughs> I keep jumping in my talks. Okay, here's a nice quote that I, um, I saw from Abu Nadud Lama. He says, above all, what sets us apart as Christians is love. We shall be asked by God, how much did you love? Whom did you love? Did you love everyone or only some? How did you love them? Nothing can transform people the way love can. Say it again. Nothing can transform people the way love can. How do you change people? You love them. You know, I always, I always think about the story of the adulterous woman. I think about the story all the time. Woman caught in adultery. The law says you stone her. They started to stone her. Everything's fine. Christ comes and he stops them. He says, who are you to judge? He who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he turns to her and he says, who is judging you now? She says, no one. He goes, then I don't judge you. Go sin no more. So does that mean Jesus likes adultery? Jesus is enabling adultery. Jesus is pro-adultery. Jesus wants people to continue adultery? No, that's not how you end adultery. You don't end adultery by saying you're a whore because she was called that. I'm sure all the other women called her that. I'm sure people gave her dirty looks. You know, the Samaritan woman, you know, they said she was at the well at noon. Why is she at the well at noon? Because the women give you dirty looks. And you all women, you know the dirty looks that the women give you. And she didn't want to deal with dirty looks, so she would go to the middle of the hot day and go to the well by herself. Because everyone had already called her a whore, and everyone had called her a tramp, and everyone had called her all the things you can call her. And people had said, you're a sinner, and you're bad, and you're horrible, and you need to change, and you need to do this. She'd heard all that. Did it work? No. And then Christ said, I don't judge you. Christ protected her. Give me the word. Christ loved her, and it melted her. That's how we change people. We melt them. We melt them with love. And says, nothing can transform people the way love can. The people who are on fire with service, you know why they're on fire? Not because someone yelled at them and said, serve more. That just made me walk out of the church. That's not how you get someone to serve. The people that are on fire that are serving is because someone, when they were younger, loved them. And it's like one candle went to the other and just touched it. Poof, two fires. That's the way fire works. And when one candle touches another one, now you have two fire. And ever since that moment, they're fire. And they were touched by the love of God in another person. 
who's in the image and likeness of God. Nothing can transform your service or transform children the way love can. Nothing can transform your service the way love can. Nothing can lead others to repentance the way love can. Repentance. Not condemnation, not yelling, not, oh, you know, get rid of that extra earring, cut your hair, don't wear that, don't let's dress like this in the church. Don't. That's not how we get people to repentance. Anytime we tell that to kids, they go, okay, not coming back, thanks. Love. Neither logic nor sermons, not even miracles, can have the same transformative effect which pure Christian love has. Christian love is derived, meaning that it is the love of Christ towards his children through you. So people touch, they see the light in me, not because I'm trying to be light, not because I want you to see my light, not because, you know, if I do this, you will like God because you will see me as so. Just be. Be with God. And then let him work. Don't try to manipulate the situation. Don't try to control it. Don't try to say, I need to act this way in front of my kids. You know, I tell you, I'm the Amin Khidm at our church, and every time the Sunday school teacher says, you know, I have to be a good example for my kids, I say, don't ever say that again. Don't ever come to the liturgy because you want the kids to see you. Don't come. Don't ever do that. That's not why we come to the liturgy. If you come to the liturgy because you want the kids to see you come early, then you're off. Something's wrong. If you don't see the Eucharist as life, as the tree of life, that's the only sustenance you have, something's wrong. And if you're going to pretend and say, I'll come to liturgy early so my kids can see it, they're going to see right through it. They know you're fake. All the kids know who the fake servants are, don't we? We all grew up, think back when you were a kid, who's the fake servant? Yep, there they are, boom, 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 uncle, uncle, tant, tant. We remember them immediately, right? So don't, don't try to be that. Don't try to be fake yourself. Christian love is a grace. Uh, okay. So how do we do all of this? Love stuff. <laughs> St. Anthony says, every day I will say to myself, today I will begin. That's St. Anthony. This is something I say to myself. I wish I could say it to myself. St. Anthony says, every day I say to myself, today I will ha begin. This is the attitude. Every day is a new day. Every hour is a new hour. Every moment is a new moment. Where does God live? In the present moment. If I start thinking about the past, what's in the past? Regret, anger, upset about how it happened. I was a victim. What's in the future? Anxiety. I don't know what's going to happen. What if this happens? What if that happens? And if I live in the past or I live in the, in the present or the future, I'm going to either be anxious or I'm going to be remorseful and upset. So where does God live? In the present moment. So every moment is the moment. The word repentance means turning to God. How do we do that? We just turn our face. You have to do a lot. Just turn. From what to what? From darkness to light. Every moment. Just turn your face toward light. Over and over again. You know, Peter, when he fell into the ocean, and he was walking on the water, and he fell, what was his sin? Why? Why? Tamara's, you know, with his mask. Huh? She said, uh, yeah, uh, she said he lost faith. He, he was scared because he started looking at the ocean. And he's like, I'm walking on water. That's not natural. And he started looking at the storm. He started looking at the waves. He started looking at the wind. He started looking at the thunder. What did he start looking at? I'll say it a different way. Who is he not looking at? That's it. That's the sin. All he did is he took his eyes off Christ. And what happened? 
He started looking at the waves and, and the problems. He started looking at eh, the world. And the world is full of it. Just turn on CNN. If you start looking at the world, lots of waves, lots of lightning. And we can argue and the Trump and the Biden and the whatever and the corona, the million things that happened this year alone. And if we look at the world, what does the world do? It swallows us up. We sink right into it. It eats us up. And the only sin is not looking at Christ. That was his mistake. He took his eyes off God. This is what repentance is. Repentance isn't, I'm going to stop doing bad things. That's morality. That's not repentance. You know, sometimes we start the fast and we say, okay, this fast, I'm not going to do this sin and this sin, and I'm not going to do, I'm going to fast more, and I'm going to eat, you know, this kind of food, and I'm going to not eat till three, and I'm going to, okay. Have you used the word God in this sentence anywhere? All you told me is things you're going to do and things you're not going to do. That isn't repentance. Repentance is, uh, the word repentance comes from the word metanya, which means a change in direction. So it means I was going this way and I'm going to go that way. That way is the world and this way is God. And so I have to look towards God. And if I take my eyes off Christ and I start looking at the world, that's when the problems happen. So St. Anthony says, every day I will start again. Today I begin. That's the attitude. That's the life of repentance. It never stops. And that's the only way we achieve love. Because when I'm repenting, and I know how hard it is, and I know how much I suck, and then you mess up, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, yeah, I know. I suck too. Let's suck together. Let's be friends. In the early church, confession was what? Public. How could that happen? Because we're all a group of people who are sinners. And we get together and we say, yeah, let's, let's hold each other's hand and let's help each other. This still happens to today. What's it called? Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program. What is that? Public confession. Hi, I'm Mark, and I am an alcoholic. I acknowledge my sin in front of everyone. And then we all say, let's talk about it. Let's get through it together as a community, as a body, one body. So this is how love happens. Right? Christ said to Peter, for he who is forgiven little loves little, and he who is forgiven much loves much. Ah, that's the secret. So he who loves little was forgiven little. Is it because he's so good? He doesn't have much to forgive? No, he just didn't repent much. And the more you're forgiven, the more you repent, the more you love. And that's why the saints who were so full of love will tell you, I was so, I am such a sinner. And they're not just saying that. And they don't just believe it. They actually are. They all are. All of the saints are sinners. As the Bunab Shoy Kamen said, saints are sinners who struggle. That's the difference. All right? And now just reading on the flight over here, the book by St. Moses on, on St. Moses the Black. And, uh, and sometimes we kind of like sugarcoat these stories, but it says he was overcome by dreams of lust and his old life and blah, 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 blah. And St. Isidore said, you know, you must do this and you overcome the old things. Let's flesh it out. What do you think he was dreaming about? What do you think he was thinking about? Imagine St. Moses the Black standing here and going, yeah, I was imagining I was raping a woman. I dreamt about it and I fantasized about that. You look at him and go, really? You know, we call you a saint now. <laughs> you did that because I don't do that. He goes, yeah, that's what I did. What else, St. Moses? And he'd say a lot of things that would make you all turn red. Go, but you're a saint. He goes, I know. But I'm a saint who struggled. I'm a sinner who struggled. And that's why I have a halo and an icon. And so St. John Clamascus says it's better than I did. To repent is not to look downward at my own shortcomings, but upwards at God's love. That's the change in direction. It is not to look backwards with self-reproach. This is the past. 
but forward with trustfulness. It is not to see what I have failed to be, but what by God's grace of Christ I might yet become. Right? So it's all very positive. It isn't you're bad, you did this, you should do more, why aren't you doing, why aren't you serving? Don't you know that if you serve, you're going to love God more? Don't you know that if you serve, you know, you're going to be better? Don't you know? Just serve and let people see it. And that's not why you're serving, but they will see it at the right time when they need to see it and they'll see the right person. Do you trust God or not? Okay. Then the right person will see the right thing at the right time. And it may not be when they're 16. That's okay. The kids may not be angels when they're 20. That's okay. 30. Okay. 40. Okay. There'll be a time. You know, I, I know so many old people that when they were living their life, they were just a disaster. You know, the uncle who's divorced twice and you see him drinking and he's at the, at, the, at the wedding dancing with some woman. And, you know, you're like, man, uncle is messed up. I remember this uncle, by the way, that I'm talking about a real person. And then five years later, I see him. He's at the monastery. He's like a changed human being. Like, what happened? You're the saya. You're the guy who came from Egypt and married three other American girls and did whatever. And what happened to you? I found Jesus. Okay. Halas. It's all past. Last quote. God can save the sinner you are, but not the saint you pretend to be. Ah, this one hurts. God can save the sinner you are, but not the saint you pretend to be. Any other questions? Okay, glory be to God forever, amen. I don't know what the schedule is now, but I'm sure you can tell us. Uh, just like before, we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll uh, get back together for the last talk. The last talk is uh, raising spiritual children. It's for parents mostly or those who are going to have children at some point in their lives. <clears throat> some of you.
بس I'm still I'm still gonna say كلمتين when you need. I have كلمتين when you need. Yes. Okay, get started. All right, so the last talk uh, is serving our children. I'm sure, are the slides up on the live stream as well? Can they see the? Oh, okay, no, I'm just asking. I'm just, uh, okay. All right, because there's a lot of quotes in this uh, particular. So I'll just read. I know it's been a long day. What time is it? Oh, everyone's going to sleep. Um, okay, I'm reading funny texts. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, this is uh, uh, about raising spiritual children. And the, the, the title of the talk is, It's Not You, It's Me. Okay? So um, I think the, the perspective we're going to take is a little bit different than the, I think what you expect uh, from a talk on raising children. So I'll start with uh, my qualifications to talk about raising spiritual children. I'm an accountant. I have a PhD in accounting. I don't have a degree in child psychology. I don't have a degree in marriage therapy or psychology or sociology or child behavior. I don't have grandkids or a good track record with my own kids. So again, just failure all around. So I have no qualifications whatsoever. What, why, and how? So question, first question is, what do we want for our kids? And so when you ask people why you bring your kids to church, they give you answers like, I don't want them to get involved in drugs. I don't want to marry the wrong person. I don't want to get, get them involved with the wrong crowd. I want them to have a successful career. I want them to get involved with the kids at church. I want them to have a community. All these things. And those are okay answers, of course. What's missing? God. <laughs> is, is one answer not in the answer of why I brought my kid to church? So a lot of these things are things everybody wants, but they're the world. Every parent, an atheist parent, doesn't want their kids to do drugs, doesn't want them to marry the wrong person, doesn't want them to get involved with the wrong crowd, wants them to be a doctor and have a Mercedes, right, and all the things, okay? So the one problem with this is if I take my kids to church for these other things, then the one thing I'm not getting is God. And the question is, is that the right motivation for a spiritual life? And is that the right motivation for bringing them? And the question is why? Why do I bring them to church then? And ultimately, if I think about it very deeply, because it's, I want to see them in heaven when I go. And I want to continue my relationship with them. I want to be with them in heaven. I don't want to ever end that relationship with my children. How? That's the rest of the talk. So how do we do that? How do we raise the spiritual children? So my goal is not to get invited back. <laughs> so that's why the, to the topic is, it's not you, it's me. So sometimes when you give a talk about raising children, people who are listening to talk think it's about raising children. <laughs> it's not. I'm not gonna tell you about how to treat them how to deny access to the internet so they don't get involved with the wrong things, how to keep them away from the world, how the media will corrupt them, how the curriculum at school will teach them the bad things, how all of these things that we think are what we need to do. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. We can't love with words. We have to love in action. And so our words are not as effective as our actions. So how do we raise spiritual children? It's not through talking. So I'm going to read you some quotes, and they're really amazing. It's from a book by Elder Proforius. He says, what saves and makes for good children is the life of the parents in the home. 
this is the part that sucks. Okay? This is the part that's going to sting. He says the parents, and we're not going to talk about the kids at all from now on. The parents need to devote themselves to the love of God. They need to become saints in their relation to their children through their mildness, patience, and love. They need to make a new start every day. Didn't we just read that quote? Every day, I say to myself, today I will begin with a fresh outlook, renewed enthusiasm, and love for their children. Who does that? Who starts every day with us with a renewed outlook and enthusiasm? Is this the image of God? So then we become the image of God. If we hold a grudge against our kids, they piss us off and we sit there for a few days and not talk to them. What are we teaching them about what God does? Does God hold a grudge? Does God punish us? He gets us back. A lot of us think that because that's what our parents did. That's what our parents told us God did. Just today, <laughs> in, the, in the altar, one, one of the little kids was talking. I think it was Gooby. Gooby Monster. And uh, he was talking. <laughs> and uh, I forgot the guy's name inside. He, he walks up. And I was getting the shorty or something. He goes, <laughs> And I looked at him. I goes, <laughs> right. you know, so, and, and we do this. We say, minnak. <laughs> Right? So we kind of weaponize God. God is going to be angry with you. Okay? We use God as a weapon against our kids. We teach him as a mean God. And the joy that will come to them, the holiness that will visit them, will shower grace on their children. This is the part that really sucks. There's a lot of parts here that, that are not good. Generally, the parents are to blame for the bad behavior of the children. This is what the saint says. And their behavior is not improved by reprimands. What's reprimand? Yelling at them, disciplining them, you know, uh, or strictness. So he's saying the bad behavior isn't fixed. If, you know, if you taught that it's in on the kids and you yell at them and you never do anything right and why can't you do this and why can't you be good and why can't you be like, this is, it doesn't fix anything. Right? If the parents do not pursue a life of holiness, and if they don't engage in a spiritual struggle, they make great mistakes and they transmit those things to the kids. So the whole time he's talking here, he didn't tell you how to talk to your kids. In fact, he's going to come here later and say, don't. Kind of the, the, the story we've been talking about as a servant, B. He says, their, their, their behavior is not improved by reprimand, discipline, or strictness. A large part of the responsibility for a person's spiritual state lies with the family. This is true. And we see this, you know, in little bits in the church. You know, sometimes you read the cynic Sar, and they start telling you the life of the saint. And it always starts with something that you think is just not really important. What does it always start? Saint such and such was raised with righteous parents who took him to the church, blah, blah, blah. We think, okay. It's a very important part of the story, right? Because the church is telling you, you know why he's a saint? His mom. Don't 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 give too much praise to Saint XX. His mom. She took him to the church. And then they'll say, his mom prayed. Thank you, Habib. Yeah. His mom prayed on bended knees for him. His mom cried for him. His mom would stand in front of the icon for him. He's not just they're not just telling you a story. They're telling you that's why he's a saint, because of his mom, because of his dad. It's a very relevant part of the story. And so the saints here are saying the large part of the responsibility for a person's spiritual state lies with the family. For children to be released from their inner various inner problems, is not, it is not enough for them to receive good advice, to be compelled by force, or do logical arguments or threats do any good. This is all we do as parents, right? We give them lots of advice. We compel them by force. I think Kinisa and I think Kinisa, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. Logical arguments or threaten them. did them. These are this is the tool belt of the the Coptic parent. And this is what we do. And he's saying this isn't the right way. These things rather make matters worse. The solution is to be found through the sanctification of the parents. Because saints become saints 
and you will have no problem with your children. Because he heard by the <laughs> That's Hany Moros for all of you on the live stream. Hany Moros is leaving. Hany Moros has left the building. <laughs> Anyone else eyes you test that when they walk out? In his defense, Henny told me he was going to have to leave, but I told, I told him I'm still going to say something. Now, yeah, uh, whatever he's going to. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm kidding, Angie. Sorry. Angie's like, yeah, I'm not, not that bad. Okay. All right. Enough. The solution is to be found through the sanctification of the parents. Become saints, and you'll have no problems with your children. The sanctity of the parents releases the children from their parents. So he's putting all of it on the parents, but he's not saying you have to parent like this, you have to say this, you have to do that. He's saying be a saint, be sanctified, and that will transmit to the kids. You know, there's a, there's a saying, and I think it's in my slides somewhere, but I'll say it now. It says, Dad, I can't hear you because your actions are too loud. Sorry, Dad, I can't hear your words because your actions are too loud. Right? How many kids, you know, have, have their parents like, you know, he won't dress as a deacon and he won't blah, blah, blah. And, and, you're, and, they, and I'm going to force him. And you're like, you know, if, if you wanted him to serve, just serve. And then he'll serve. Because, you know, the kids, they end up like their parents, don't they? Don't we? When you were a kid. How many times did you say, I am never going to be like my dad? I am never going to be like my mom. Guess what? Tricks on you. Jokes on you. Who'd you turn out like? Just like your dad and just like your mom. Despite all your efforts not to be like them. It's a, it's a force. You can't stop it. It's like a tractor beam. You know, in Star Wars, the tractor beam sucks in the Millennium Falcon. That's not important. What is, is the, 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 the kids... They're just going to be like that. And that's why we can be calm. This gives us a calmness, right? Because, yeah, a kid says, ah, oh, you know, I'm an atheist now, or I'm, you know, I like abortion, and I'm, and, and parents go, oh, my God, and what idea? He's 14, and he says, you know, he, you know, I remember uh, one time Justin came up to me, and he was like in eighth grade, which is very young, and he goes, you know, I don't, I don't think I believe in creation anymore. I think it's, I think evolution, I, you know, the teacher talked about evolution today and it makes a lot of sense. And I, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me about, you know, evolution and, and the science and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know, first my heart started, oh my God, my kid's going to leave. Uh, you know, and then calm yourself down. And then just very uh, calmly enter into a dialogue, right? And just say, well, well, what is it about it? And he says, and I go, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense, you know? Uh, natural selection, survival of the fittest, of course, all that makes sense. And you can have a very calm dialogue knowing that th they're going to they're gonna do their thing. We did our thing. They're going to do their thing. Okay, But in the end, we know that what's going to bring them is I'm going to be like my mom or like my dad. And I see in them the goal. And there's nothing I can do to stop it. When your children are young, talk to them about God. And when they grow up, talk to God about them. Love this quote. We can talk to our children about God, but after a while, when they're older, and I'm thinking like sixth or seventh grade, time to slow down a little. Now it's time to pray. Right? Oh, sorry. Is this better? Okay. And this is, this is the frustration that happens, right? The kids get older and they start having problems and we want to do something. And this saint is saying, pray, talk to God. And you're like, I got to do something. This is my kid. I'm losing him. I'm losing her. We freak out. Why? Maybe we don't have trust. Maybe we don't really believe. Maybe, you know, all this church stuff is fine, but my kid's on drugs right now. We got to do something. And you tell me prayer, that's not the right answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prayer for the other people. When you have a problem, I'll tell you to pray. When I have a problem, we got to do something about this. Okay? All of a sudden it got serious. And this is 
this kind of submission to God is very difficult for a parent. This transition, all of us who've had teenagers have started going through this transition. We know it very well, right? When you lose control and it's not easy, parents don't do well losing control, especially after having absolute control. How many bites of food your son took is in my control. And now I have no control, right? But I have to realize it's not my son. It's God's son. I was just the guy they put, you know, he put me in charge for a few years. You know, you just change the diapers and feed him. I got the rest, right? So he's not really my kid. And that's hard to make that jump, right? When you, when you say, when you look at God, you say, all right, he's your kid. You deal with him. You figure it out. That's not easy. So the stuff I'm going to tell you is very simple, but very hard. And as all Christianity is, Christianity is very simple. It's not complicated. It's just very, very hard to do. And so what we choose to do is not that. <laughs> we'll choose to do other things, right? Because the, the real stuff is hard, and it takes me to dig deep and fight with myself. And I'm not interested in doing that. So I'd rather fast the whole Great Lent and feel really good about myself or come to church early, do a bunch of things, and feel good. A child needs to be surrounded by people who pray and pray ardently. Ardently means well, heartfelt. A mother, and this, is, this quote is amazing, a mother should not be satisfied by giving her child a physical caress. Caress means to hold, to love, to touch. But should also coddle it with the caress of prayer. So as imagine the mom is coddling the baby and loving the baby in prayer. In the de you know, uh, you know, uh, Pope Shenouda used to have this saying, and I loved it. He said, you know, when, when, when a woman cooks, he's like, you can taste when a woman cooks and she's praying when she cooks. He's like, the food tastes different. And I believe him. He says, you know, tabiqh, Yani, what's done bil, bil the tabikh with the psalms tastes different than the tabikh without the psalms. And I believe him. Because he's, he's, uh, he's appealing to a mysticism that makes no human sense. Obviously, saying words does not affect the food. But he's appealing to the fact that we live in another realm of, of mysticism. That we live in another realm that is not what I can see. You know, as St. Paul says, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, or entered the hearts of men awaits those who love your holy name. So there's another world out there, and he appeals to that. So he's saying, you can't just hug the child. You caress it with your prayers. In the depths of its soul, the child senses the spiritual, spiritual caress that its mother conveys to it, and the baby feels the prayers. And it feels closer to their mom because she's not just physically hugging it. She's praying and she's feeling and the baby feels the prayers. It feels security and certainty when its mother mystically embraces it with constant, intense and fervent prayer and releases it from whatever is oppressing it. It's beautiful. And this comes back to this quote. We need to start talking to God about our children more than we talk to our children about God. We love to give the talks. And the, the talks were just about God. They're not. They're more, they're lesser level. They're like, this is not okay. What are people going to say? This is an appropriate behavior. This isn't right. This makes us look bad. No God, just me. This makes me look bad. This is embarrassing our family. You know, when, when, the, when the kid gets the earring and the, or the girl gets the weird color in her hair or the whatever, and you're like, and how's this going to look and blah, 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 blah. Who's that about? You're embarrassing me. Imagine what that does to a kid. Then I hate you is the response. And that's about the right response.
St. John Chrysostom says, if but ten among us lead a holy life, we shall kindle a fire which shall light up the entire city. Again, do you guys see the theme? Fire. Be fire. You want to light up your family? Not literally. You want to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I came out wrong. Um, you want your you want your family to be have this this flame of love, then just be fire in the middle, and the family will pick it up. You know, going back to the candle. Sometimes when you hold a candle very close to another candle, but they don't touch, the first candle will, will light it's by itself when it gets close enough. Right? That's how we light up our family. Can't just talk and yell and force them, and then threaten them. And if you don't come to church, I'm going to take your phone, and blah, 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 blah. You just have to be this love. You be the light. You be what they see, and they want to be that. This is a good quote. Pray, and when you have to, speak. <laughs> Pray, and when you have to, speak to your children with love. Lots of prayers and few words. Lots of prayers and few words for everyone. We mustn't become an annoyance, but rather pray secretly and then speak. And God will let us know in our hearts whether the others have accepted what we have said. If not, we won't speak. We will simply pray mystically. So what you say may not be accepted, and that's okay. I want to speak to them mystically. Because if we speak, we become an annoyance, and others react or even infuriate, infuriate them. This is why it's better to speak mystically to the hearts of others through secret prayer than to their ears. You want to talk to someone? Tell God to talk to his heart. Don't talk to his ears. Wow. Because every once in a while, you'll, you'll talk to someone, and they'll say, you know, there's a problem. Okay, let's pray. You don't want to help me? I just did. Go, well, go talk to him. Go say something. Go do it. It's not going to help. That's not how we're going to get to him or her. Right? And so what he's saying is to the child, pray to the child. Pray that God changes their heart on the spot without the words. Why not? Why, why, why not do that? Don't you believe it'll work? Like, but then they won't know. Then they won't hear it. They need to hear it from me. I need to be an example. I need to, I need, I need. Do you believe that God could do that? Do you? And this is where I come up against my faith, right? Because now my kid just did something. And obviously in certain situations, I'm, I'm going to teach them and I'm going to, but when I see their heart hardened and I see them not living or, or, or even I want them to learn a spiritual lesson and I see them interacting with another child and I, I don't like the way they're interacting with that child. I could go give a lecture, but I'll be an annoyance. I'll be a nag. I'll be a, a whatever. And they won't respond. Okay, mom. Okay, I know. Okay. Right? That's what you're going to get. So have I ever thought now as, I get, as they get older, I've done enough talking. And now the response is, okay, I know, I know, I know. Maybe now it's time to switch. Talk above. Pray to God about your children. Talk to God about your children. Um, okay, this, this quote's so nice. We can keep guard over the whole world by keeping guard over the atmosphere of heaven within us. This is big words. We can keep guard over the whole world. You want to change the whole world? Then keep guard above, over what's inside you. That's how you change the world. One of the saints says, acquire the Holy Spirit and a thousand around you will be saved. Acquire the Holy Spirit and a thousand around you. You have to go be talking. For if we lose the kingdom of heaven, we will save neither ourselves nor others. You guys know when you get on a plane, they bring down the oxygen tanks and they do a little demonstration. What do they say? Please put the mask on yourself before putting the mask on your child, right? Because if the plane's losing and there's oxygen, you may pass out before you get a chance to put the mask on yourself. If your kid passes out, that's okay. You have the mask on yourself. You put the oxygen on the kid, the kid will come back, okay? And once you put the oxygen on them. But if you pass out, then you're done because the kid ain't going to put anything on you. 
Make sense? What's he saying? Take care of yourself first so that you can take care of others. Remove the, the, the log out of your eye so that you can see clearly to remove the log out of someone else's eye. If we lose the kingdom of heaven, then we save neither ourselves nor anyone else. So if you want to say, well, I bring my kids to the church so that they can go to church. What about you? I'm older now, you know, I don't, when was the last time you went to confession? I mean, you know, I'm not 16 anymore, you know, I'm a grown man. You got a point? You got a point at the end of that sentence? What does that mean? What'd you just say? Did you just say you're without sin? Did you just say you don't need repentance? Did you just say you're done with God? That you've reached some level of holiness that you don't need to go any higher? It's like someone saying, you know, I want to get closer to the sun, so I'm going to stand on this piece of paper, and now I am closer to the sun. And I think I'm close enough. I'm on a piece of paper now. God's infinity. So what, your 20 years of life have put you to the point where you can look and say, yeah, I'm, I'm close enough to God now? I mean, that's, that's crazy. Right? And so if we, if we lose ourselves, then we lose everything. Because I can assure you, lose your own soul, and your kids ain't going to church. You can bring them to all the meetings, and they can learn all the hymns, and they can do all the things. That's nice. They'll just watch you. And they'll say, oh, yeah, my dad leaves. My dad didn't attend the liturgy. And some parents, they love it. They go, oh, yeah, my kids, they're great. They go without us now, and they love to go, and they just drive by themselves. It's awesome. It ain't awesome. Because in a few years, he's going to be you, and he ain't going to go either. Maybe he's going for his friends. Maybe he's going because he's a deacon. Maybe he's going because he gets a sort of in Sunday school. Maybe he has a, a power role that he likes. Ah, that's going to fade. It's going to be over that pretty soon. Right? So if they see you not going and you not caring, you know, and you drop them off at the, the meeting and there's a Bible study and you go, well, I'm not going to the Bible study. I'm going to go to Starbucks. What do you think your kid's going to do when they're your age? Forget your age. When they're 20. Does anyone believe they're going to continue to go to Sunday school when they saw you go to Starbucks when there was a meeting? Or when they don't see you ever reading the Bible at home or ever conversing about God or ever praying? What do you think is going to happen? They're going to be you. That's what's going to happen. Right? So if you're just like, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I bring the kids, you know, I, and, and they do this. We, we do this. We throw it on the church. We say we want the church for the youth. We want the, the activities. We want the abuna to do stuff for the kids. It's all about the kids. No, it is not all about the kids. In fact, in the early church, we didn't even baptize kids. That's a late invention. We didn't even baptize them. Christianity is an adult religion. It's for adults. It's not for the kids. We allow them to be baptized because of what this elder said before. There's a mysticism. They don't understand communion, but we give them communion. They don't understand baptism, but we give them baptism. Because there's a mysticism to it. But, the, but Christianity, real Christianity, is for adults. And that's when it gets tough. And that's when they all fade away. Right, when it gets tough. We can all talk about lessons and judge, don't judge, and be humble. And until an adult who's 35 or 40 says something to me, and I'm 40, and I'm like, you know what? I'm too old for this. Do you know what he said to me? We're done. al Christianity got real, and I'm not interested in real Christianity. I'm interested in plays and camps and retreats and songs and he 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 and all this real. Okay, so we don't bring our kids to the church for them. It has to be for us. In fact, I remember you know at, at one point in our uh, when I when I moved to LA, we, we went to it. We started a, you know we were part of a new church. And it was, it was kind of fun because so many people at the church, <laughs> we didn't have much of a Sunday school. We had one class, and all the kids went in the one class. And, uh, and so many people would, would say things like, yeah, we don't really care about the kids. We're here for us. And I love that. Like, we didn't even have Sunday school at our church for years because no one cared. Like, just get the kids out of our hair. We want to go to the meeting. We want to hear Abuna. 
We're here for us. And so many people, and it was so amazing and beautiful to see, they're like, it's our turn. We missed out. We're here for Christ. We're not here for the kids. I don't really care about the kids. Kids can do whatever. They'll be back later. That's not my priority. All right? You got to put your own mask on before putting the mask on the other, on the child. He who has himself, who has the kingdom of God in himself, will imperceptibly pass it on to others. So that's it. You get the kingdom of God, and then you imperceptibly, which means you don't know you're doing it, pass it to others. And they just absorb it. People will be attracted by the peace and warmth in us. They will want to be near us. And the atmosphere of heaven will gradually pass on to them. And you don't have to say a word. You don't have to do a thing. You don't have to give talks. You don't have to go to focus on the family, resources for children, you know, blocking on the internet, blah, 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 blah. Let's do all those things. That's not giving them God. That's giving them a lot of rules. And I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm not saying putting restrictions on kids is bad. I'm not saying those things. I'm saying that's not giving them God. If you want them to have, if you want them to have, you know, good sleep patterns and you want them to have, you know, not be on the internet all the time and okay, that's fine. Right. But if you want them to have God, that's not coming from Sunday school. FYI, that's not going to come from the servant or from the half hour a week they get. You know, they see you 10 hours a day. And if you think you're going to offset that with the half hour on Sunday, good luck. That's not going to happen. They will want to be near us. The atmosphere of heaven will gradually pass to them. It is not even necessary to speak to people about this. The atmosphere of heaven will radiate from us even when we keep silent or talk about ordinary things. It doesn't have to be about religious things. It will radiate from us even though we may not be aware of it. And in fact, God often keeps us from being aware of it. One of the gifts of God to man is that you have no idea what kind of influence you're having on other people. This is a gift. God protects you from yourself, from your own ego. So many times when we're serving, we have no idea what we did. We have no idea we affected anybody. And someone will come out of a class and the class was a disaster. You know, the kids were talking and you were yelling and blah, blah, blah. And some kids will say, that was a great lesson. You're like, what? Were you in the same room I was in? That was horrible. How many times I've done this where I, I give a talk? In fact, it happened last week. And I felt it was horrible. <laughs> I was so... I was boring. I just was reading from a book. I felt I was disappointed that, and I got like 10 texts. Thank you. Okay. So God does, you don't do. And that's why also in the service, sometimes we get a little carried away with what we're going to do. We have to let God carry. It's his church. It's his church. Like I said, you're not needed for the service. God does. And so sometimes we get a little overwhelmed, like, well, this is going to happen. And do we have enough servants? And what if this happens? And there's anxiety. What does anxiety equal? No faith. It's like, I don't really trust God. I got to worry about this because God doesn't have it covered. Right? It's kind of like the, the wife that's very anxious about lots of things that the husband is supposed to do. Why is she anxious? Because he doesn't do it. So she's always tracking. Did you, did you do the thing? Did you take out the trash days Friday? Did you blah, blah, blah? And she's tracking for him. Now the husband who actually does stuff, he doesn't have a wife who tracks for him. She's fine. She's peaceful because she, she trusts her husband's going to do it. But if she thinks her husband isn't going to do it, then she has to keep a running total all the time. Okay. That's what, and women are very good at that, right? They can multitask. They have like 17 tabs open all the time, right? But when we do that as servants, that means we don't think God's got it. And that's not to say I'm going to not do my part, but the overly anxious, over anxiety, over fear. Hey, hey, I mean, where's God? It's his house, his church. These are his, these are his sons. They're not yours. Even your own kid isn't yours. He's on loan for a couple of years and he's going to leave you and say, I hate you, dad. You suck. Right? That's what's coming. Okay. So here we go. Mm, I won't tell the story. Okay. This is the most perfect way for the mother to speak to God and for God to speak to the children. If you do not communicate in this way, constant lecturing becomes a kind of intimidation. 
And when the child grows up, it begins to rebel. That is to take revenge, so to speak, on its father and mother who coerced it. The most perfect way is you speak to God and God speaks to the child. Do you believe that happens? It's a question. It takes faith. And when you constantly lecture the kid, there's intimidation. In the end, the kid resents you because you're like, you made me. Because one of the things that God creates us with, as you all know, is a free will. That's a big thing. Okay, that's not simple. Because, I mean, I don't even want to give my kid a free will. Now, God creates man with the will to look at God and curse him and say, I hate you. And he allows you to. So this freedom of will that God gives us is very highly protected. Enough that we can use it to crucify him with it. And he's like, okay. Is that what you want to do? Okay. You're like, what? I mean, think about the story of the prodigal son. That story is about the father. It's not about the son. That story is about a dad when the son goes, I want to take half your money and go spend it on prostitutes. And the dad goes, okay. What is that? That's mind boggling. That's craziness. That's the kind of freedom God gives us. So now imagine you, you, you go to your son or daughter and you say, you have to accept God. Where's the freedom of will? Where's the openness? Where's the right to choose? You can't make anyone be a Christian. You can raise them in the church and you can teach them the things and you can make them come. And they can come more dangerously their whole life and not be a Christian. Now you've, now you've done a crime. Now you say, just fast, just fast. Just come, just come. Just learn, just learn. Just do, just do. Where's the God here? Where's the God part of this? Where's the Christianity part of this? We're just doing and making and forcing and, and it's not going to happen unless I transform. This is the quote I said, what you do speaks so loud then I cannot, that I cannot hear what you say. That's the summary. You want your kid to serve, serve. You want your kid to love, love. They'll see you and they'll do. And they can't help it. And they can rebel when they're 16, fine. They're going to say, I hate you, fine. They're going to say, I'm never going to be like you, fine. You will. We all know it. It's only, this only goes one way. You end up like your dad, no matter what you want. My dad even had hair. Yalla. Um, anybody have any questions? George. Um, there's a lot of stories on uh, repetition uh, of things makes it a habit, and it's a one way to get your spiritual life holy. And even priests and uh, uh, monks and people who are very holy, um, I have experience with some of them. Like, I don't want to come to church. Just come. Just come. Please see. Okay. So that kind of, and there's a lot of examples in the Bible, I don't know all of them, but you know, this kind of repetition goes against the idea of uh, free will and do whatever you want, and when the time comes, you will, you will know God. So how do you balance uh, like the, the habit, creating the habit, so you get to push yourself a little bit, versus like, do whatever you want, whenever you want? First of all, I didn't say do whatever you want, whenever you want, but, um, the oh, the question is, um, and, and it's a good question. Um, it's a perfect question is, is, you know, lots of people say, well, create a habit, you know, do things until there's repetition and that gets them eventually involved. And, um, eventually they start to do more and more. And, and, and Eba Mc, Eba Macarius from SUT has this great thing, you know, where he says, you know, let the kids sleep in the church and then someday they'll, they'll grow. And, and, and that kind of loving thing, um, that's absolutely true. And what I'm saying is that's absolutely true young. Okay. And that's absolutely not true old. Okay. So when your child's 20, if you're still forcing him to ship ship to get out of bed, to go to church, something's wrong. Okay. And if your kid's three and you're saying, well, how do you feel? Do you want to go to church? No. 
Okay, so we have to, in, in, as parents of young children, we have to create in them the habit. Okay, but my point isn't creating in them the habit or not creating in them the habit. My point is, what's the source of the habit? Okay, I'm not creating in them a habit because I need to create in them a habit so that, no, no, I'm going to church. I'm finding God there. That's it. Okay, and so that's the prime, that's, that's 97% of it. Okay, now the other three is, well, how much do I push and how much do I not? When they're young, I'll push. When they're old, I won't push. Somewhere in the middle, I'll transition. Maybe with this child, I'll push a little longer than that child. And every parent has their own wisdom with their own children. Right? And you, there's no carte blanche rule that's going to fix all that. But my point is, what's my driving? When they were two and they couldn't see me and feel, what was driving me to go to church then? What's driving me to go to church now? Am I finding Christ or not? And that, more so than how much do I push and how much do I not push, but they're in the fourth grade and they want to go late, but this he wants to dress as a deacon. More so than that, that's 3%, okay? And we can talk about the 3%. But I think what we do is we talk about the 3% as if it's 97%. That's, I guess, all I'm saying. Yeah, Mir? Um, I think, yeah, I think that's what we're saying. I think that we can put in the good things to raise church goals. But what about raising Christians that have to be part of life? They have the other six days of the week. And that's a good, that's perfect. I mean, I'll, I'll repeat it, but you know what Mira is saying is, uh, it again, comes back to your objective, right? If my objective is I want to create a church goer, a churchy kid, create a habit, then is that the, the goal you should be uh, going for? Or are you trying to create a Christian who will do? Because sometimes we can get too fixated on the goal, right? I mean, you know, this is this is a, a common thing, right? And it's it's difficult to balance. And I don't know the the right answer here, but. Um, you, you know, it's like fasting. Uh, yeah. This is something that's ingrained in all of us. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to get them used to fasting, so they get used to fasting, so they can fast. And slowly, I'll build up to the 55 days, and eventually, we'll get there, and then they'll they'll have fasted 55 days, and then they can do the whole fast. Okay, this is a common sentence said by many parents. Okay, where's God in that sentence? Where's spiritual life in that sentence? If the objective is, I want a kid who by the age of 15 can fast 55 days, if that's my objective, which if I look carefully, that is my objective. I want him to be able, he should be able to fast the whole fast by 16. So what's the objective? Fast the whole fast by 16. If that's the objective, yeah, you got to get him used to, to eating tamaya. And, you know, I'll, I'll put kamun fil food and then you can, and then you get used to the food. Okay, well now he's used to Tameya. Congratulations. You have a kid who likes Tameya and food and can go for long bouts as a vegetarian. That's what you have achieved because that was your objective and you have succeeded at that objective. Now, if you want a, a child who, who wants to feel God fast, well, that's up to you now because now they have to see you during Lent. Say, you know, let's not watch TV today. I'm just going to read the Bible if you guys don't mind. I'm not going to ask you to read the Bible. I'm not going to tell you to read the Bible and say, hey, who's, why aren't we reading the Bible during the Lent? Come on, guys, you should be. I'm going to sit and I'm going to read. Where's dad? He may not, they may not see you for a month. That's okay. Where's dad? He's reading. Why is he watching Fox News like he does every night and yell at Biden? Because it's Lent and dad doesn't watch TV during Lent. Oh, he doesn't? I've lived here for nine years and I never noticed. Yeah, that's what dad does. Okay, so now I have another objective. Fasting is going to get me to God. And they're going to see that through me only. If my fast takes me to God, then their fast will take them to God. But sometimes I don't even want to fast. I hate fasting. I don't like it. And so what do I do? I just kind of make the kids do it so that they get used to it. So that, okay, they fasted. Congratulations. Because you know that the... the, the Forcing is part of the struggle of being a Christian, forcing yourself, putting yourself in the habit. 
the pastor prayed to stand to be the Bible. Like that's it's not a, a, at the point of time, oh he's 16 now to get he on his own. Like you're even doing it for yourself. Like your point, like it's I'm doing it for me too. I'm forcing myself and my kids. Is, but that's the key. You said a key word there. Forcing yourself is part of it. Yeah. Forcing someone else. So he has to force himself and he will struggle. We all struggle, right? There will be a time for him to struggle, right? Where's that transition? I don't know, okay? But I can't force him to struggle. That's impossible, right? I, I can't force you to love. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I don't know if it's appropriate, but one time my, my son was, we're in the middle of Lent and he was like 14 and he just got really upset. He's like, I'm done with Lent. This sucks. I have nothing to eat. This is terrible. And he got all upset, right? Justin just to a tantrum. So I was like, okay, no problem. It's like Saturday morning. I opened the fridge. I got some eggs. I scrambled them. I go here, eat the eggs. Kind of looks at me like stunned. You know, and I'm like, God doesn't need you to fast. God gets nothing when, when one of these ants fasts. He's not waiting for your fast. If you're not going to fast in love and you're not going to fast as a sacrifice and you're not going to fast as a way to get closer to God, then don't. And when you're ready, do. I'm going to fast. And if you want to have egg, here, eat the eggs. And when you're ready to fast, fast. You know, now if I had, if I had dropped the hammer on him, which is my first instinct, okay, that may not have ended well. And so th those are the times when I have to rely on, it's a long game. He may not fast this year. He'll fast next year, right? He'll see me fast. And like the tractor beam, he sees me fast. He, this, this only goes in one direction, right? You can't fight it. But the key is you have to hold on. You have to do the fasting year in and year out. And not because I want my son to see me, but because I need it. It's for me. It's my time. It's my church. Does that make sense? Any questions on the internet that are people angry? Okay. The life of the children seems to be affected by the radiation of their parents. If the parents insist, come on now, go and make confession, go and receive communion. This is the forcing. And so on. Nothing is achieved. But what does your child see in you? How do you live? And what do you radiate? If, you're, if your child is seeing you radiate anger and jealousy and talking about people and lying and gossiping, which is stuff I see all the time, and the parents are openly gossiping about everybody in front of their children, and about the priest, about the bishop, about the metropolitan, about whoever, where do you think this is going to go? And then you tell them, go to Sunday school. What? That's not going to happen. And then we complain. Sunday school isn't doing anything for my kids. Well, of course it's not. You think that half hour is going to do anything? They're going to tell you a story about Noah's Ark and you're going to be like, oh, okay, I guess I'll stop gossiping and judging and hating. And the kids are all fighting and the kids are talking about each other behind their backs and there's backstabbing and they're jealous and they're, and, and where'd they learn this from? Oh, I don't know. Let's look at home. There it is. Constant, 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 constant source. The ma'agza of garbage. And they're like, you know, uh, the, the servants aren't doing enough. My kid's a disaster. Yeah. Just like the saint said, it's coming from the home. Does Christ, how do you live and what do you radiate? What does the child see in you? Does Christ radiate in you? This is what is transmitted to your child. This is where the secret lies. And if it is this, and if this is done when the child is young, it will not be necessary for it to go great travail, a lot of work when it grows up. It just grows up given naturally in the spirit. It feels warm. It feels love. It feels God. And it's attracted to God. And when it sees the world, which it will see, and it will see bad, and it will see good, and it will see the internet, and it will see drugs, it will see friends, it will feel comfort this way. It will know that's the right way. And it will go there. Not because you put a lock on the internet and not because you said you can't go out with this friend, but you can go out with this friend and you can't stay up till 11, but you can stay up to 1030 and you, that ain't going to do it. Good luck. All right. I mean, the first thing I learned when I was trying to stop my kids from getting on the internet is that I had no ability to do that whatsoever. 
The way they can bypass everything is shocking. I even found out they put stuff on Google Docs for each other, right? Because at, at the school, at the school, they can go to Google Docs, right? Because the, 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 the internet blocker is going to let you have Google Docs, of course, right? So then they put all this crap on folders that they share in school so they can, you know, do whatever they, I mean, you cannot stop it. They are smarter than you. One time I took Anna's phone. I swear, I took her phone like for four seconds, okay? So I had her phone and then maybe it was 40 seconds. And then all of a sudden I was looking at her phone and a message pops up. I know you got your phone taken away, so let's switch to blah, 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 Google, whatever, blah, blah, hang on, sir. <laughs> Within four seconds, everyone around her knew that her phone had been taken away and she just bypassed me, right? And I'm thinking, Shh, I'm, that's very effective what I just did there, right? So that's, you're not gonna win that. You know, you're not gonna win. I don't want them to see the world. They're going to see it. You know, I'll put them in, in these kind of schools to protect them from the bad things. The bad things are in the school, and then the bad things are there when they leave the school. Everything's waiting for you. But if they felt, if they felt God in you, then when they see the bad things, which they will, and there'll be many options, they're going to feel warmth and kind of home. That one. That one feels right. Right? When they meet two people and one's angry and hateful and bitter and resentful and the other one is just saying love, they're going to say, I like that guy. That's the one that reminds me of my dad. Hopefully it's not the angry, bitter one that reminds me of my dad. And that's why they always say, you know, girls marry men like their father. It's a common thing, right? Why? Because he feels like home. And if the dad's abusive and angry and hits her and beats her and demeans her, then guess who she marries? A guy who beats her and demeans her and humiliates her and insults her. Just like my dad. So they even marry that way. Okay. Should we stop? Just being nice. Okay. What do we pray for? Okay, last thing. We shouldn't continually continue relentlessly in order to acquire what we want. Rather, we should leave all things to the will of God. This ain't easy because what we want is what we want. For our kids, we want what we want. What happens when we pursue what we want? What happens when we pursue what we want? These wants always increase and we are never satisfied with what we have. The more we chase after these wants, the more elusive they become. If we pray for good grades, next we'll ask for a good job. Then if it will be for a better job, and so forth. What should we ask for in our prayer? I'll stop there. What do we teach our kids to pray for? So in the icon of the crucifixion, the icon of the crucifixion, you all know, there's a right-hand thief and a left-hand thief. And the left-hand thief, what did he ask for? So first of all, whenever people are talking to Jesus, what are they doing? They're praying. So when I talk to Jesus, I'm praying. So the right-hand thief and the left-hand thief are doing what? They're praying. The left-hand thief said, I want what? I want to come down. I don't want the cross. I got stuff to do. I got stuff over here. I got, I want to live my life. I don't want to die. What is he asking for? The world. Even if you look at the icon, the left-hand thief is looking away from Christ and he's looking at the world. So he's asking for the world. And the right-hand thief, what did he ask for? The kingdom. So one type of prayer is, I want the world. And the other type of prayer is, I want you. Most of our prayers are left-hand thief prayers. Most of our prayers is I want stuff. You know, as one, one guy says, like Jesus is the cosmic vending machine. Give me, give me. I'll put in a dollar. I'll put in some, you know, ashur. Uh, I'll put in some service. I'll put in whatever. I'll put in uh, nedr. Okay, and then you give me college degree, married, Mercedes, good job, doctor. So what do I really want? I just want money. I want the world. The world that perishes away. 
give me the world. It's like when the kid opens Christmas time and then he's, you got him this really great gift and they start playing with the wrapping paper, right? You guys ever see this? Or the little, the little foam peanuts inside the, the box. And the kids love the foam peanuts, and which cost 30 cents. And the $200 thing that you got them is thrown on the side and they're playing with the peanuts, right? And like, stupid kid, this is a great thing that I got you and now you're playing with the peanuts. You left the good thing and you're playing with the foam. This is what we do. So we ask God, the prince of the world, the prince of, the, uh, the prince of heaven, and we say, I want the world. Saint Arsenio says, it's like when you go to a king and you go to a, 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 the, the, the most powerful king on earth and he says, I'll give you anything you want. What do you want? And you say, could you give me a pile of dung? That's what Saint Arsenio says. Can you give me a pile of crap? Imagine walking to a king who says, my whole kingdom is yours. What do you want? He said, give me a pile of poop. He says, won't that king look at you and go, really? That's what you're going to ask me for? You want a car? You want an A? Don't you want me? Aren't I better than that? You're asking for the foam peanuts, not the iPad? Right? So... What are we teaching the kids to pray for? Often we teach them, pray for the world. Ask for stuff. God will give us stuff. If you do a nedr, you even get more stuff. If you give Abu Nafal to us 100 guinea, it's a batak. What should we ask for in our prayer? In our prayer, we should ask only for the salvation of our soul. The secret is to ask for your union with Christ with utter selflessness, without saying, give me this or give me that. Imagine you walk in your kid's room. Or imagine your kid is locked up in the room and they don't come out, which is what's happening lately. And they only come out and they say, make me a sandwich. And they go back in. And then they come out half an hour later. I want something to drink. And they go back in. I want you Nikes. And they go back in. What mom or dad is going to take that? After a while, you're like, you only come out to ask me for things. You don't say please or thank you. And when are we going to just talk? In fact, a good parent does what? I'm not going to get you new Nikes. I'm not going to get you a new thing. We're going to have a relationship. This isn't a relationship. This is you barking orders at me. And if I don't get it fast enough, you get pissed off. Isn't that what we do in prayer? I want, and then it doesn't happen. I've been praying for two weeks, and God didn't give me what I wanted. I don't believe in him anymore. If he was a real God, he wouldn't have let it happen. If God was real, he wouldn't have let my child whatever. If God was, then this would not, have, there's what God would ever allow. Whoa. All right, this is what, we, what people do have big loss. I prayed for it and he didn't give it to me. Is that the relationship? When the kid asks you for new things and you say, I don't think it's good for you to get another pair of Nikes. And they go, okay, then I'm not your son. Is that a, is that a relationship? Would your parent tolerate that? Would you tolerate that from your kid just barking orders at you? No. We're going to have a conversation. You're my daughter. You're my son. I'm your parent. You're going to tell me how the day went, you're going to tell me what makes you happy, you're going to tell me what makes you sad, and we're going to talk. And, and as soon as I see my kid just having barking orders at me, I stop that right away. This is how we interact with God. We just bark orders, and if it doesn't happen, we get mad. Okay, I'll stop there. Any other questions from the internet, the interweb? Anyone from any live people? Those can also ask questions. <laughs> okay, good. Alhamdulillah. All right, glory be to God forever. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll uh, start now with prayer vespers.
uh, before you leave. Okay. Uh, Mira uh, will say something for us. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. Don't worry. Okay. So thank you, Mark. Um, if you haven't noticed, this is this is a series of uh, spiritual days that we're trying to do multiple times a year. We're aiming for once a month. Um, okay, we're aiming for once a month, uh, but we don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic and the lockdowns. But um, we just didn't think of a better person to kickstart the service other than Mark. Uh, but stay tuned for more spiritual days. Having said that, um, we have a, a lot of opportunities. Uh, we've talked about um, the structure of the service here. We have a great Sunday school. We have great Sunday school teachers. I think the hearts are in the right place. But we also believe it's not enough. And there is a gap that we need to fill. Um, and we truly believe that everybody in the congregation has a place and a calling. And that's why we took the first tab into putting a laundry list of things to give people options so they can sign up to what they feel that their heart is on. Next slide. Uh, we believe all roads should lead to Christ. I work in a sales organization, and I always tell my team, if you're doing any activity that does not lead to a dollar sign, please do not do it. So I think the call to action for all of us, if you're doing a service that does not lead to your kid's salvation, please do not do it. So here is the list. Um, these are the four areas that we thought about. If you know any better, please go ahead and tell us. Uh, and this is also going to be on Facebook, so you don't have to read or, you know, just we're just giving you ideas. But here's the, the laundry list of, uh, of services. Pick one or pick all. We, uh, if there's a calling and there's something that's on your heart to go and serve and you think that this is one of the things that we're missing here to build a community and for all of us to end up together again at the end of the road. Um, I was talking with Mark over the phone and I said, life is very short, but eternity is very long. So let's um, you know, make sure that we have a good crowd going there. So uh, let's start with that. So look at these, uh, reach out to the Shoy, myself, Jonathan, anyone that you feel comfortable to talk to, tell them this is something that I want to work with you guys on. We have a lot of secret servants that are leading those efforts. So raise your hand and join the efforts. Um, uh, I always say, don't be a Martha or a Mary, just be Christ-like. So uh, when you do those services, just remember this, that this, this should be the mantra of our service. Thank you so much.
Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not temptation, but let us leave one in Christ Jesus our Lord, for us kingdom come, the Lord. From the Christos, he says, Ben Shois, Lil, Mati <speaking in Hebrew> We thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us here with us, God, accept to his bed, and support us, and have brought us to his hour. That God may have mercy and compassion on us, hear us, help us, and accept the supplications and prayers of His saints for that which is good on our behalf at all times, and forgive us our sins. Lord, have mercy. Therefore, we ask and entreat our goodness, O lover of mankind, grant us to complete this holiday. All the days and our life will be with you, or fear, all envy, all temptations, or of Satan, the counsel of our criminals, of enemies, hidden and manifest, hidden and manifest, take them away from us and from all your people, and from their holy place. Um, um, but those things which are good for all, do provide for us, given us the authority to the answer, but covenants up and all the power of the enemy. Kriya lai son te nosh te me viot me me pshiri ne mpebne matua Kriya satua bno mosi oas Shereti kriseya bim te niangilo Shereti varte no se tas nizben sotir Shereni mare Eyati et sherom piet, asos liet os nisen ane mechnoti bilo. Sherene mare, eyachenu shere, poav shere mare, poav piet oav. Shere mi chayi, yel binesh tenar shi angel. Shere habri yel besot en bechay shenovi Shere nisher obim Shere nisher afim shedam afiru neboran yun Shere yuan ne es binesh tiem akarod Romo shere piyem wil shengenis en emano yel Shere nasho Señor, tiene abo, 
O solo shen mati ti sin te ben choi si su ve festo shere no kopi mar ti ro shere fi evangelisti shere fi apostolo sava martos pi te orimos shere no kopi mar ti ro shere fi choi genge ele o shere fi apostolos ba choi se boro ge o Orgeos hitene prezveyan te 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 oto kosto ab mare ab shoy sari emot nanem digo e volente ne novi etere no ho sero knen de ki otena avatus ne mevne vai to ab je ab kom kak soti mo na enan. Ibi drosef ki sto si tere bo Keto dnev mati so Keto sad kaza van prator The father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ We ask and then treat your good soul Over of mankind and remember our Lord The souls of your servant full and sleep our Father and our brother, pray for our fathers and brethren who have fallen asleep and repose in the faith of Christ since the beginning. Our Holy Fathers, the Archbishops, our Fathers, the Bishops, our Fathers, the Hegumens, our Fathers, the Priests, our Brethren, the Deacons, our Fathers, the Monks, and our Fathers, the Laymen, and for the full repose of Christians, that Christ our God may repose all their souls in the paradise of joy. And we too accord mercy unto us and forgive us our sins. Lord, have mercy. Blessedly, O Lord, the repose of their souls and the repose of our holy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, sustain them and give back to us the water of rest and the paradise of joy. The bliss out of which you grieve sorrow and the groan have have faded away in the light of your sins. Raise up the birds also in the, in the day which you have appointed, according to true promises which are without lie. From the good things of your promises, that which one has not been heard, seen nor ear heard, neither have come upon the heart of man, the things which you owe, God, have been prepared for them that love your holy name. For there is no disfruit for your servant, but the butcher, if every negligence or heedlessness has overtaken as men, says they were clothed in flesh and dwelt in this world. Oh God, as a good one, lover of mankind, graciously accord to you, O Lord, your servant, our six Christians who are the whole world. From the east to the west and from the north to the south, each one according to his name and each one according to her name. O Lord, repose and forgive them, for no one is pure, and of that blemish even though his life on earth be a single day. As for those, O Lord, whose souls we have taken, repose them, and may they be worthy of the kingdom of the heavens. As for us all, grant us our Christian perfection, that of pleasing unto you, and give them an us a share our heart is with all your sins. Lord, have mercy. Graciously accord, Lord, to keep us this night without sin. Blessed are you, Lord God of our fathers, exceeding blessed and glorified be your name forever. Amen. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us according to our hope in you. For the eyes of everyone wait upon you, for you give them their food in due season. Hear us, O God, our Savior, the hope of all the regions of the earth, and you, O Lord, keep us safe from this generation and forever. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Blessed are you, O Lord, make me understand your commandments. Blessed are you, O Lord, enlighten me with your righteousness. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Despise not, O Lord, the works of your hands. You have been my refuge from generation to generation. I asked, Lord, and said, have mercy on me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. Lord, I have fled unto you. Save me and teach me to do your will. For you are my God, and with you is the fountain of life. In your light shall we see light. 
let your mercy come unto those who know you and your righteousness unto the upright in heart. To you belongs blessings, to you belongs praise, to you belongs glory. O Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, existing from the beginning, now and forever and ever. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to chant to your name, most high, to sit, o most high, to show forth your mercy every morning and your righteousness every night. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, one of the virgin, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, is crucified for us, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, is Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, and now and forever and in the ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. O Lord, forgive us our sins. O Lord, forgive us our iniquities. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. O Lord, visit your people, heal them for the sake of your holy name. Our Father, and Lord, have fallen asleep. O Lord, depose their souls. O you who are without sin, Lord, have mercy on us. O you who are without sin, Lord, help us and receive our supplications. For yours is the glory of the dominion and temple holiness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, bless us. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us such trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he is not temptation, but lure us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for his kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lift up our prayers unto your beloved Son, that he may forgive us our sins. Lord, the only virgin was brought forth unto us, the true light, Christ our God. Ask the Lord on behalf, he may have mercy on our souls and forgive us our sins. O Virgin Mary, the only thing that caused the faithful advocate for all mankind. Intercede on our behalf before Christ, to whom you bore, that he may forgive us our sins. Hail to you. Virgin, the right and true queen, hail to the pride of our race, who to us, Emmanuel. We ask you to remember us, O oh, our faithful advocate, before our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may forgive us our sins. The adornment of Mary in the highest heaven, at the right hand of her beloved, entreating him on her behalf. As David has said in the book of Psalms, the Queen stood at your right hand, O King. Solomon has called her in the song of songs, my sister and my spouse, my true seed of Jerusalem. For he has given a symbol of her in many high names, saying, Come out of your garden, O choicest aroma. Hail to you, O virgin, the right and true queen. Hail to the pride of our race, who bore to us, Emmanuel. We ask you to remember us, O our faithful advocate, before our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may forgive us our sins. Seven archangels praising as they stand before the Pantocrator, serving the hidden mist. They call is the first, Gabriel is the second, Raphael is the third, a symbol of the Trinity. Suriel, Sedakiel, Sarathiel, and Anani, the great and holy luminaries, entreating him for the creation. The cherubim and the seraphim, the thrones, dominions, and powers, the four incorporeal creatures carrying the throne of God. The twenty-four presbyters in the church of the firstborn, praising him without ceasing, proclaiming and saying, Holy God, heal the sick, holy, mighty, O Lord, repose those who are asleep. Holy, immortal, bless your inheritance, may your mercy and peace be a fortress to your people. Holy, 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 O Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full 
of your glory and honor. And when they say Alleluia, the heavenly response saying, Holy Amen, Alleluia, glory be to our God. Intercede on our behalf, O angelic armies and heavenly orders, that he may forgive us our sins. The first among the apostles, who is called Simon Peter, he was entrusted with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Also another one is John he loved him very much he rested his head on the shoulders of our Savior and the rest of the disciples they have all, all honor also on the account of the apostleship for they followed our Savior pray to the Lord on our behalf for my lords and fathers the apostles and the 72 disciples that he may forgive us our sins uh O oh, Mark the Apostle and the Evangelist, the witness of the passion of the only begotten God, you have come and enlightened us through your gospel and taught us the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You brought us out of darkness into the true light, feeding us the bread of life that came down from heaven. All the tribes of the earth were blessed through you. You and your words have reached the ends of the world. Hail to you, O martyr, hail to the evangelist, hail to the apostle, mark the beholder of God. Pray to the Lord on our behalf, and beholder of God, the evangelist, mark the apostle, that he may forgive us our sins. St. George completed seven whole years, being judged daily by seventy lawless kings. They could not change his mind, nor his upright faith, nor his great love for Christ the King. He was singing with David, saying, All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of Jesus my Lord, I took revenge upon them. For great is your honor, O George, my Lord and Prince, for Christ rejoices in you in the heavenly Jerusalem. Hail to you, O martyr, hail to the courageous hero, hail to the struggle. Mento, George, my Lord and Prince. Pray to the Lord on our behalf, O Christ bearer and martyr, George, my Lord and Prince, that he may forgive us our sins. Watch over, Watch over us from on high where you dwell, O Lady of us, O the ever virgin Theotokos. Ask of him whom you have borne, our good Savior, to take away our troubles and grant us his peace. Hail to you, O Virgin, the right and true Queen. Hail to the pride of our race who bore to us, Emmanuel. We ask you to remember us, O our faith. Faithful advocate before our Lord Jesus Christ that he may forgive us our sins. We exalt you, the mother of the true light. We glorify you, Saint Theotokos, who you have brought forth unto us, the Savior of the whole world. He came and saved our souls. Glory be to you, our Master, our King, Christ, the power of the apostles, the crown of the martyrs, the joy of the righteous, the firmness of the churches, the forgiveness of sins. We proclaim the Holy Trinity, one Godhead. We worship him, we glorify him. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord bless us, Amen. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Pontifex, Lord, Creator of heaven and earth. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten not created, the one essence of the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us met and for our salvation, came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and of the Virgin Mary, and became man. And he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffering was buried on the third day. He rose from the dead according to the scriptures, ascended into the heavens, sits at the right hand of his Father. And he has come again as Lord, just living in the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. Yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who the Father, the Son, is worshipped and glorified, who spoke with our prophets, and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we confess to our present for the mission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. Amen. Ten gosh te vol hai ten ti anastasi Ten te nirlef mot nem bi on Ten te bi on es neyo amin
O God, have mercy upon us. Set her mercy upon us. Have compassion upon us. Amen. Amen. Take your anger from us, visit us with your salvation, and forgive us our sins. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Ebi brosefki stafite Get up, Nevmati. So, Master Jesus Christ, our God, who is at the center, honor the Sabbath and Holy Apostles. Many prophets and Rashmin have desired to see a thing that you see and have not seen them, and to hear things that you hear and have not heard them. But as for you, blessed are your eyes for seeing there's a for there. May we all thought here and talked according to the Holy Gospels, the rosary of your sins. Pray for the Holy Gospel. Lord, have mercy. Remember, sir, master, also said, but then ask for remember the supplications and the prayer of your father and your Lord, our God. Those have already fallen asleep, remove them, sir, kill them, for you are. There are salvation of souls, hope of souls, the healing of our soul, and the resurrection of our soul. Sasite metavo bothe o akusumento agio evangelio. Atim jeve thevraf she sentinigon. Ki av sabto ka tamar kona ge evangelio tonasma. Sasi kireya. In the fear of God, and let us listen to the Holy Gospel. A reading from the Gospel according to Saint Mark. May His blessings be upon us all. Amen. A reading from the Psalms of our Father David, the Prophet and the King. May His blessings be upon us all. Amen. Then the channels of the sea were seen; the foundations of the world were uncovered. I called upon the Lord, and He cried and cried to, out to my Lord. He heard my voice. Hallelujah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, our Lord, God and Savior and King of us all, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, to whom his glory due forever. Amen. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable, and he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables so that seeing they may, may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on the stony ground. When they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world 
the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things, entering choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Glory be to God forever. Our Father, heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive us our trespasses. Come back to us, Jesus, bring joy. Let's keep the last moment to get the night. No pain, so keep it. Let's come in, time to be with Him. Here in the bosom. O Master of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, the Lord of God, the Father, has broken every bond of our sins through His saving life, giving suffering. So, please enter the face of the Son and send the Holy Spirit and sit to them. They receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are returned. You for if you forgive the sins of. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You also know our Master have given grace through the Apostle to those who for a time will be restored in the church to forgive sin upon the earth and to ban lose every bond of iniquity. Now also we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, for your servant, my father, my brother, my weakness, those who bow their heads before holy glory, dispense to us your mercy and lose every bond of our sins. And if you have committed any sins against the Lord and unruly, or show sorrow, anguish of heart, or indeed, or word for hardness. O Master, who knows the weakness of men and the good one, lover of mankind, O God, grant us the forgiveness of our sins. Bless us, purify us, absorb us, and all your people. For us with your fear, sins and our good will, for you are our God, the glory, our dominion, our worship, and you, the Father, as well, and the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, and so you ever, ever, and ever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit now and ever and unto the ages of the ages. Amen. We proclaim and say, O our Lord Jesus Christ, bless the seeds and the herbs. May your mercy and peace be a fortress unto your people. Save us and have mercy on us. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord bless us, amen, bless me, bless me, Lord the repentance, forgive me, say the blessing. Christ was when naughty, amen, as a show. O King of peace, grant us your peace, establish for us your peace, and forgive us our sins, and for yours is the power, the glory, the blessing. And the might forever and ever. I mean, because we're to see our Father, heart in heaven. How be thy name? Thy kingdom come. How be done? Amen. Our Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Wala mahabbat Allah alayhi wa nyamat 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 alayhi wa